Madam Chair, it looks like the membership is starting to stabilize. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Uh, let's go ahead and get started then. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you to this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It's March 3rd, 2023 at 11.02 a.m. My name is Jennifer Urban. I'm the chairperson of the board. Before we get set started with the substance of the meeting, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask that everyone please ensure your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. Everyone please also note this meeting is being recorded. The meeting will be run today according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. If you wish to speak on an item and you are using the Zoom webinar, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I'm sure most people are pretty familiar with it at this point, but if you'd like to take a minute to locate it now, um, if you anticipate you'd like to speak on an item, please do. If you wish to speak on an item and you're joining by phone, please press star nine on your phone. That will show the moderator that you are raising your hand. Our moderator will call your name when it is your turn and request that you unmute yourself for comment at that time. Those using the webinar can use the unmute feature and those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting on the webinar. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comments. That's agenda item seven today. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please use your the raise your hand function to let us know and the moderator will recognize you. Please be aware again that each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item for public comments. And if you're speaking on an agenda item, both board members and members of the public must contain their comments to that agenda item. Relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene, in addition to sticking to an agenda item for discussion under that agenda item, both board members and the public may discuss agendized items only, with the exception of when the board takes up the agenda item for general public comment that I just mentioned. And um, items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future board meetings when the board takes up our agenda item for that purpose, which is number eight today. We will take breaks as needed. Um, we, if we are continuing to meet at 2 p.m., we'll take a break then um, for about 20 minutes. And I'll also check in to see whether anyone needs an earlier break for lunch um, or shorter breaks. Um, please note that the last agenda item today, or the, excuse me, the ninth agenda item today, the last is adjournment, um, is a closed session item. Um, assuming that we remain um, taking the items in order, um, we will leave and then just come back to adjourn so the public can decide whether or not they would like to stay um, uh, uh, through the closed session item. Um, as usual, my many thanks to the board members for their service and everyone who's made this meeting possible. There's a lot of work behind the scenes, um, and there's a team supporting us today. Mr. Philip Laird, our general counsel, he's our meeting counsel today and has a couple of items to present to us. Uh, Mr. Ashkan Sultani, who's here as our executive director and will be giving us an update. Um, I'd also like to especially thank and welcome our moderator, Mr. Kevin Sabo. Um, and Mr. Sabo, I'll ask you now to please conduct the roll call. Okay. Uh, board member De La Torre. Present. De La Torre present. Board member Lay. Present. Lay present. Board member McTaggart. Here. McTaggart present. And Chair Urban. Present. Urban present. You have four presents and uh, no absences. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, the board has established a quorum, and I'd like to um, remind board members that we'll take a roll call vote today on any action items. With that, 
Um, we will move to agenda item number two, if you're following along on the notice agenda and agenda, excuse me, which is an update um, from the chairperson. Um, so again, welcome everybody to the meeting. I have a short set of updates today. Um, first, as usual, I'll situate today's meeting and the board's current work so it's clear what our overall purpose is today. Our overall focus continues to have two main components, the work necessary to build out the agency and rulemaking. Uh, we've been spending the bulk of some meetings on rulemaking and others on discussions of administrative and structural tasks. Our last meeting on February 3rd was focused on rulemaking. Um, the board approved a package to go to the Office of Administrative Law for approval in that meeting. Today's meeting is focused on topics related to administrative matters, specifically the agency's budget and board oversight of that, along with further topics related to building the agency, organizing, and regularizing um, our processes. Uh, accordingly, today's meeting follows from our meeting on December 16th, 2022, in which we discussed board oversight and input into the yearly state budget process and staff's recommended framework and schedule for regular updates and consideration of, of budget and legislation. Um, today, we'll be implementing the budget oversight framework the board adopted in December with the discussion of the agency's current budget change proposal. That will be under agenda item number four. We will also be continuing our discussions of frameworks and processes for organizing the board's work with two agenda items. The first is a discussion of our practices with regards to subcommittees and staff's recommendations for organizing this under agenda item number five. The second is a discussion of staff's recommendation for a framework and schedule for identifying priorities and topics for rulemaking, somewhat analogous to the framework for legislation we discussed in December, and that's agenda item number six. So we're working our way through, continue working our way through discussions of some of the big ticket items the board and the agency work on to allow us to regularize those, create expectations um, for planning, um, and to be able hopefully to have um, a, a regularized calendar, which will obviously be supplemented um, as needed um, so that we have though a good sense of timing and methods for board input and oversight. Uh, my hope is that we will be able to create that sort of basic calendar for regular meeting topics on budget legislation, rulemaking, and that kind of thing matched up to relevant state calendars. So the staff can plan for our input and provide the information we need in good time. And so we can plan as well. Um, as I mentioned, of course, we'll always have agenda items that come up organically. And there may be times we need to accelerate our plan schedule because something comes up, um, but hopefully we can get a basic framework in place um, and, um, and have a sort of a good structure moving forward. Um, and then, as mentioned today, we have general um, items that we often have for general public comment and future agenda items. And finally, at the end of the agenda, as I mentioned earlier, the board will go into closed session to discuss aspects of the executive director's annual review. Um, I have three additional updates. First, on the strategic planning process. Um, I feel as though you may think I'm just being continued to be optimistic, but I do believe the procurement process is nearly complete. Um, and we will begin that, um, we'll be able to begin our strategic planning um, as soon as the vendor's in place. And as ever, my thanks to uh, Ms. Vaughn Chidambira, who's our Deputy Director of Administration, who's overseeing procurement. Second, and somewhat related to the strategic planning, we don't yet have a second gubernatorial appointee for our fifth board position. I'm hoping we will have one soon. Uh, of course, it would be great to have a new board member in place for that strategic planning process. Um, third, uh, Congress continues to consider the federal ADPPA, the Data Protection and Privacy Act. Um, the board has been very clear on the agency's position. We strongly support privacy protections for all Americans, but we cannot support a bill that does this at the expense of Californians. My thanks again to the board for its rapid consideration of the issue in July of last year and its clear direction to staff on the agency's position. And my many thanks to the staff for their careful and tireless work on the agency's behalf to protect Californians' privacy on this. The reason I'm mentioning it today um, is because I'm delighted to highlight a joint letter signed by our agency, the governor's office, and the office of the attorney general that went to this week to Congress on this issue. This is a strong statement for Californians, made stronger, I think, by um, being a um, joint statement um, speaking with one voice, 
I'm grateful to the governor's office and the office of the attorney general for standing with the agency on this on behalf of Californians. I'm very grateful to Ms. Maureen Mahoney, our deputy director for policy, Mr. Sultani and others on the staff. This is the part where the tireless comes in <laughs> as coordinating agency voices rightly requires um, a lot of work behind the scenes um, so that everyone is following their processes properly, but it, you know, it does take a lot of work and time. So um, many thanks um, from me and I expect all of us on the board. Um, I'm also pleased to note that the agency received in return a letter from Representative Eshi's office um, thanking us um, for our efforts and pledging to continue fighting for Californians' privacy. Um, so these efforts are really greatly appreciated. Um, for those who are interested, I believe um, the letter will be up on our website um, soon. Um, and uh, generally, just thank you. Um, and uh, I know we all encourage Congress to provide strong privacy protections for Americans um, and not to undermine Californians' protections in the process. Uh, with that, I will uh, offer my um, usual um, offer to please sign up for our mailing list. If you're interested in our work, you can look at our join our mailing list page on cppa.ca.gov um, and ask if there are any questions or comments from the board members. I just wanted to second um, the thanks to the board for, you know, for the letter and, and the, the quick work on that, you know, the ADPPA is still going on. Um, there's still a lot of action on it. And uh, hopefully, you know, with <clears throat> this letter, um, you know, Congress can understand our position and, uh, you know, make sure they don't preempt California. So thanks for the work on that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Anything else? All right, with that, Mr. Sabo, uh, may I ask if you can check to see if we have any public comments at this time? Public comments on this agenda item from anyone? Yes, we're on agenda item two, chairperson's update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone if you're joining by phone today. Again, this is for agenda item number two, chairperson's update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands this time. Great, thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, I'll do one final scan to see if any board members have a comment. Um, all right, in that case, let's move to agenda item number three, which is an update from our executive director, um, Mr. Ashkan Sultani. Um, Mr. Sultani, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, and thank you to the board for the opportunity to provide a brief update today. As per usual, I'd like to touch on three topics today, hiring, rulemaking, and then budget, which I'll do as part of a separate agenda item. <clears throat> An update on hiring. So the agency is continuing to steadily grow and we're about at 50% of our anticipated complement under the current stat statutory appropriation. In addition to the great hires that we've made in the fall, I'm pleased to announce that we've since brought on our CIO, fiscal manager, and as Chair Urban outlined last meeting, our senior privacy counsel and advisor, Ms. Lisa Kim. We're also in the process of re reviewing applications for the head of enforcement, assistant chief counsel, and public affairs deputy, which we're hoping to provide an update on at the next board meeting. Once those, additional, once those additional exec team members are in place, we plan to continue to grow out the key legal, public affairs, and enforcement divisions, assuming approval of our BCP request, which I'll touch on later. I also hope to, oh, I just, I just wanted to share that I'm incredibly proud of not only our rate of growth, but the quality and culture we maintain in our growth. We built out an incredible team and I'm incredibly happy that it shows uh, not only the quality of our work, but our internal dynamic uh, as we've grown as an organization. Now onto our rulemaking, uh, an update on our rulemaking. Uh, following the February 3rd board meeting, uh, staff implemented the board's direction and submitted our rulemaking package to the Office of Administrative Law on February 14th, Valentine's Day. As previously outlined, OAL has 30 business days to respond to our submission, approve the regulation, or notify the agency of any potential deficiencies. 
If OAL does not approve the regulation, we'll have to do an additional, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have an additional 120 days to cure any deficiencies and potentially need to revise the regulation and go after an additional 15 day comment. Alternatively, as previously outlined, there's also the possibility that OAL could approve a portion of the regulation and allow us to withdraw the remainder. And once again, we would need to revise any deficiencies uh, in the remainder through a 15 day comment period. In that uh, scenario though, we would likely need to complete and resubmit our uh, revision to OIL before July 8th of 2023. In either event, by my math, 30 days from February 14th will essentially be the end of March for an initial decision by OIL. Um, following the same, following the same uh, meeting, the agency also issued uh, an invitation for preliminary comments on the proposed rulemaking on cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision making. The agency will be accepting and is currently accepting pre rulemaking comments on these topics until March 27th at 5 p.m., after which point staff will begin reviewing the input we've received. We're encouraged by the engagement we've seen so far on these important issues, and we're looking forward to strong public participation in this pre rulemaking period so that we can learn as much as we can. The agency is eager to hear from the public about their experiences and receive their input. I'll stop here as the agenda item, uh, the budgeted item is a separate item uh, uh, to discuss. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Sultani. And I really appreciate you highlighting um, not just the rapid growth in the staff, but what a crackerjack team you've put together. I really wanna commend you and, and everybody um, for, for that work um, and hark back to um, uh, um, Mr. Thompson, whom we missed, who we miss, whom we miss, and I know, you know, he mentioned early on how important um, culture uh, is to an organization. So um, uh, I wanted to just reach back and highlight that um, with thanks um, to you and for all the team um, for every all the great work you've done to put together a strong um, group. With regards to the rulemaking, if I may um, uh, take the chair's prerogative for a second. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. So the July 8th um, deadline, if we needed to make changes, that is related to the overall um, uh, Administrative Procedures Act uh, framework, right? Like we have to finish the package within a certain time period. And I'm, I see Mr. Laird has come on. Thank you. Sorry for the question to... Not, not a problem. That, that's correct. Um, we typically have a year to complete the rulemaking from the date of the initial notice of the for formal rulemaking um, period. The one nuance here is if, for instance, we were to receive a disapproval from Office of Administrative Law, we automatically get 120 days, which in our case would take us below, beyond that July 8th date, but we would have the, that additional space to to cure any deficiencies. Oh, wonderful. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. I mean, we're obviously we're well within the year um, at this point. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mr. Lynn, for that clarification. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Thank you. I was just wondering if there is a um, process for the director to report to the board in terms of um, our diversity and inclusion efforts. That's something that we highlighted as important um, as a group. And I know that, you know, there's statistics and ways to do this that are respective of the privacy of our staff, but I would very much like to have a little bit more granular understanding of where we are on that. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Absolutely correct. This is something that has been important to the board. Mr. Sultani, is that something you need to look into? Something you can let us know? Uh, I'm happy to look into it and um, figure out the appropriate way uh, to report out those figures. Um, I'm encouraged to say that we have and we've often been in meetings um, uh, positively uh, kind of um, received, you know, uh, supported in our DNI efforts. So um, I, I expect the board will be pleased, but I'm uh, happy to um, highlight those uh, kind of our, our staffing and our uh, uh, inclusionary efforts and find the appropriate way to provide that. Maybe at the next um, staffing update or admin update, I can do that. And I think we're, um, I'll just add, we're, we're also required to report that at, uh, to the state um, through a regular process as well. Okay, okay. Um, thanks so much, Mr. Sultani, and thank you, Ms. De La Torre, um, for the request. Um, any other comments or questions from board members right now? 
Okay, um, with that, um, Mr. Sabo, um, could we please invite public comments on this agenda item if anyone has a comment? Uh, we are on agenda item three, executive director's update. If you'd like to make a comment on agenda item three, executive director's update, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Again, this is for agenda item three, executive director's update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, then I will do a final scan to see if something occurred to any of our board members. And seeing no hands, um, let's move to agenda item four. For those following on the notice and agenda, this is um, number four, budget update and priorities for spring 2023. Mr. Sultani will be presenting this budget update as part of the process and schedule we adopted in our December 2000 to 2022 um, meeting, um, as I mentioned a bit earlier. If members of the public would wish to see what is discussed, um, I would refer you please to the materials for um, that meeting, um, December 16th, 2022. There's a memo that goes with um, the relevant agenda item, which I think is number five, if you wanna see more about the overall process. Um, okay, so the governor has released the state budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. So we have for our review, the current budget change proposal, um, commonly referred to as a BCP for fiscal year 2022-2023, excuse me, 2024. Um, and we are now at the point in the schedule. Um, and here I'm just gonna paraphrase from the staff's memo in December where staff briefs the board on the details of any approved um, BCP uh, that appears in the governor's January 10 budget. And board members um, will ask questions about um, the BCP and provide any additional direction that we might have on budget purport priorities to inform the executive director and staff's work um, during spring legislative engagements and the May revise. And I think um, our executive director is gonna give us a little background on the process um, at this point from the state side. Um, I will note the memo estimates that this happens in January, February, so it's March 3rd, we're three days later, but we're well within the budget schedule um, to provide us an opportunity to give input within the budget schedule, which is the most salient thing. So with that, I'd like to ask everybody um, to turn your attention to the materials for agenda item number four today. That's where you, you will find the BCP um, in case you'd like to refer to it. And Mr. Sultani, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Urban. And thank you to the board for the opportunity to discuss the agency's budget today. So quick touch on process as uh, Chair, Chairperson Urban also um, highlighted. Um, at the December meeting, the board adopted the process for the board to hear regular updates about the agency's budget and provide timely direction to staff on budget requests and priorities. The process was designed to ensure that the board stays informed about the agency's budget expenditures and forecasts to enable all board members to have meaningful input into the budget change proposals and to enable staff to respond to fast moving budget negotiations in a timely and effective manner. In this process, we outlined key points in the year for the board to provide input. Specifically, we recommended that sometime each summer, the agency present to the board a plan describing our recommended fiscal priorities and budget goals which then staff will prepare and submit to the Department of Finance in the fall in the form of a budget change proposal, requesting additional positions and spending authority reflecting the priorities laid out by the board. After the budget proposal is published, staff will present the details of any negotiated BCP to the board so the board may ask questions and direct any changes for the spring legislative engagements and may revise. <clears throat> by way of background, the spring finance letter, now called the spring budget change proposals, are additional ways for the agency to request revisions, add positions, increase budgetary authority, or increase uh, funding, and must be submitted to the Department of Finance by April 1st to, to address unanticipated changes or uncertainties within a program or its funding. In addition, 
May revise letters are designed as ways for agencies to do last minute cleanup of budget bills or fund pen, pet projects of the legislature using excess revenue from Department of Finance's last revenue projections of the general fund. Then on May 14th of every year, the governor releases the revisions to the proposed budget, which the legislature reviews and passes in the form of the Budget Act on June 15th. Finally, the government, governor signs into law the Budget Act uh, for the new fiscal year, which becomes effective on July 1st. We're now in the step of the process where we present the details of our proposed BCP so that the board may ask questions and direct any changes for the spring legislative engagements and may revise. As discussed in my previous presentation on the budget, the proposed financial year 23-24 BCP builds off our current year priorities of rulemaking and public awareness, but begins to incorporate our planned deliverables for the upcoming fiscal year. Our proposed budget was uh, published in the governor's uh, proposal on January 10th and is now being considered by the legislature. We will be presenting, we'll be also presenting this BCP in front of the um, Senate Assembly Budget Subcommittee later this month and in front of the Assembly in early, early April. As I just laid out, following the discussion by the board, we also have opportunities in spring by way of the spring BCP and early summer by way of the May revise to request additional changes or revisions. You can refer to the BCP that was shared with you uh, and is also available publicly on the Department of Finance website for additional details on what I'm about to present. Specifically, our 23-24 BCP requests seven positions in fiscal year 23-24 for uh, and, and ongoing to provide additional staff resources necessary to allow the agency to develop its enforcement and IT divisions pursuant to its statutory responsibilities. This includes five specialized attorney positions in the enforcement decision following the appointment of the department, the deputy director of enforcement, which we're in the process of hiring for. This allocation is modeled after the initial staffing approach when similar agencies such as the Department of Justice or Department of Financial Protection and Innovation took when given new enforcement authorities. Importantly, the size of this, this size team will allow us to establish baseline numbers justifying future growth. For example, once we have further metrics on the size complexity of cases the agency will pursue, as well as the number of complaints we need, will need to field as we receive them. With respect to IT, the agency requested two specialized IT resources, an IT manager one and IT specialist three, to support our enforcement and consumer complaint function in-house, as well as additional oversight and audit related functions, such as maintaining our public facing portals for complaints and submissions of data privacy impact assessments and cybersecurity audits to the agency. If approved, this proposal will provide the necessary positions to continue developing the agency's units and divisions utilizing the existing appropriation of 10 million from the general fund uh, ongo uh, in ongoing authority for these statutory required activities. In addition, as discussed in our last admin meeting, the BCP also includes the requisite Department of Finance personnel adjustment drill 9,800 and 3.6 drills, which all state agencies utilize to maintain current service levels and adjust personnel costs by approximately 2%, bringing our revised authority to uh, 10,236,000. Now, moving forward, I know some members of the board requested additional information on how the agency could seek a cost of living adjustment beyond the standard uh, per personnel 9,800 and 3.6 drills that I just mentioned. Specifically, Section 19995A of our statute appropriates ongoing sum of $10 million adjusted for cost of living changes for expenditures to support the operations of the agency. As we also pre uh, previously discussed in the last admin meeting, the agency can seek in any budget year a cost of living adjustment of our st statutory allocation of $10 million. This request can take uh, take a few forms, but typically occurs via the st uh, STD 26 budget revision request. The agency did not request this increase in 21 and 22, as we are still operating under our statutory allocation. But we have discussed this adjustment with the Department of Finance previously. We generally agreed they would incorporate back years at, the, at whenever time we do request the adjustments. Should the board opt to request the cost of living adjustment this year, we would be able to request a 4.2% increase for budget year 21-22 and a 7.3% increase for 22-23 based on the Department of Labor, sorry, the California Department of Industrial Relations Urban Consumer Con uh, Price Index 
for California, which represents the cost of living figures that the state typically relies on for these calculations. If directed by the uh, board to pursue the COLA adjustment this year, the subsequent and, and subsequently, if it is approved by the Department of Finance, the adjustment would increase our statutory allocation from 10 million to, to 11.181 million uh, uh, ongoing. However, as the appropriations as, a, as the appropriation doesn't inherently grant us spending authority, we would likely recommend that along with this revision, we request approval from the Department of Finance of seven additional positions to further develop in our enforcement and audit functions, including an assistant chief counsel in enforcement, as well as three investigator auditor positions and three supporting management staff for coordinating our enforcement function and complaint system. Finally, in addition to the requested positions, staff will likely recommend a small revision to our administrative process, which would allow us to more efficiently undertake enforcement activities. Specifically, we'd like to request a statutory clarification that would ensure that enforcement and division attorneys are able to represent the agency in administrative proceedings, as currently the law would require us to return, retain the attorney general's office for representation unless granted a waiver. So that's my overview of our proposed BCP and budget plan. Again, uh, you have the specifics in the form of the uh, published BCP change, uh, which is also available on the Department of Finance's website. I'll stop here and I'd be happy to answer any questions about the budget process, BCP, or COLA adjustment. Thank you so much, Mr. Sultani. Can I ask a quick process question? Um, uh, if the board were to, um, actually, you know what, I'll hold it and just Let's have a more general discussion first. It's kind of a technical question. Um, all right, um, comments, question. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Sultani, for that careful and detailed overview, which I, I find very use, useful in, in sort of untangling um, what is happening with the budget process at the state level and all the many different um, acronyms and indeed many different BCPs. <laughs> so it seems we have the Jan BCP and the spring BCP. Um, so so this, this, is, this is really helpful. Um, thank you. Um, comments, questions from other board members? Please use to raise your hand. Thank you, uh, Mr. McTaggart um, and then Mr. Lay. Thanks. <clears throat> um... You know, I, I brought this up before, and I, I'm, I'm, perhaps someone, maybe Mr. Altani or, or or the Mr. Laird could educate me. I'm still stuck on this whole notion of <clears throat> request, because you know the statute couldn't be any clearer than it is. There's no requesting part. It is the statute literally says there is hereby appropriated this money. There's no review part of it. There's no if the governor approves. There's no if there's money in the budget. And it doesn't say, you know, oh, if we ask for cost of living changes, it literally says adjusted for, for COLA. And there's no, there's no wiggle room. I mean, 9.4 million Californians voted for this. And so uh, I, I'm just struck as a, as a board, how can we, we can't do anything other, it would be negligence not to demand the whole thing. And I'm still just kind of perplexed how we're even this notion of, oh, well, if the appropriations gives it to us, there's no question, they have to. This is the law. And can you imagine if the teachers, if, if you know, with the, what was it, Prop 98? I mean, they get whatever, 40% of the, of the budget, period. Um, so I, I'm, maybe, some, could you guys educate me this? Because again, I, we went through this last fall. I, I, you know, I kind of went along, I was new, but, but as I look at this $10 million number, you know, and I, and when I think about the, oh, well, maybe we don't have enough. Of course we can spend it because one of our responsibilities, uh, as, as the statute says, is to promote public awareness and understandings of the law. And so we could and should be saying, well, if we don't have enough personnel, we can spend this on public awareness. And, and my one point there, which I'm going to kind of um, bleed two points into one, is just uh if we get to that the california broadcasters association is does a, has a program to do psas for government agencies and they there's not a third party buyer that marks it up and there i mean a ton of government agencies do it the department of the solid waste management the emergency services the you know caltrans the department of managed health care all these agencies and i can send a list um 
use this PSA to spend money to get public awareness and to educate people. So just kind of in a nutshell, if you could explain to me how we can't, how there's any possibility of not getting our maximum dollar, why we're even asking whether or not we would ask, we don't have any right not to ask for it. And they don't have any right not to give it to us. So can we just, I guess, uh, uh, I'll pause there. Thanks, Mr. McTaggart. Okay, I would like to have that on the table um, and go to Mr. Lay um, so that we have yeah. all questions open. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I generally understand where Ms., uh, Mr. McTaggart is coming from. You know, if this money is available, I think as a matter of course, if there is funding that is excess. I'd like to see that go to public education. That said, this year is is an interesting year, uh, you know, California wide. I think you know there's there's a massive budget deficit, and I do think um, the agency, at least going in under budget this year, would contribute to you know lessening that. Uh, and, and I do believe um, there is funding left for public outreach and awareness that we banked in previous years. Um, so, uh, but that's not to say I, I do, I think, you know, the number should be 11.81 or 18 million, I believe, uh, according to Mr. Sultani. Um, yes, and as a, you know, a matter of general, um, you know, my thoughts generally, I, I do think, you know, it would be good to spend that money if we could. Um, <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge that this is an interesting year for California. And, and in this instance, this year, and, and during these circumstances, I think going in under budget or at 10 million uh, may be more acceptable to me. And I'll just leave it at that. Thanks so much, Mr. Lay. Uh, Ms. De La Torre, did you, um, I'm not pushing you. I just wanted to be sure you had a moment to say something if you'd like. Uh, I was waiting because I, you know, I'm listening to everybody who's sharing. Um, but before we move on to a different topic, I will have an opportunity to um, share my thoughts as well. Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, in that case, um, I have a couple of thoughts on this. Mr. McTaggart, would you like to expand before? Well, I just, I, I, I want to just uh, perhaps either the executive director or or general counsel could could opine on this comment. While I while I appreciate Mr. Lay's uh, desire to you know do something to help the budget process. Um, I'm struck by the fact that that would sort of put one point of view, his point of view, over the will of nine and a half million Californians. I mean, this is crystal clear in statute. It doesn't say if the board decides not to ask for it. It says shall be appropriated. And so I, I just don't know that there's any wiggle room we have here. We have to ask for it. And frankly, if we don't get it, we have to sue them, which we're going to get it because it's in the law. I mean, it would be breaking the law not to give it to us. So I just would like to have an understanding of, of, of that because it's this is, you know, to me, it's just right there, plain text. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, so um, I have a couple of thoughts on a couple of the threads that have come up in the board members' comments so far. Uh, first, um, in response to Mr. Lay, uh, for my part, in terms of spending priorities, um, and also Mr. McTaggart, I fully support um, um, uh, some attention to public awareness, considered attention to public awareness. Um, I thank Mr. Lay for highlighting the encumbered contract that I think um, the public awareness subcommittee um, and um, executive staff worked on because I think that is a really good um, vehicle for making sure that we have um, some resources set aside to, to work on those important topics. So I'd like to highlight that. Um, with regards to um, our um, money appropriated in the statute, my understanding, Mr. McTaggart, has sort of three components. Um, first of all, um, absolutely, um, under the statute 1798.199.95a, um, uh, $10 million plus cost of living is appropriated to us each year. The statute also says that the expenditure of funds under the appropriation shall be subject to the normal administrative review. And here is where, so, so there's, we have the appropriation, we have normal administrative review. And as I understand it, and I could be wrong, and I definitely um, will ask Mr. Laird and Mr. Sultani to 
um, to help continue to illuminate this is that that is both um, that is both in the statute that there will be that review, but also there is a sort of a functional practical way that that administrative review affects how funds actually are allocated. Um, so we don't have, and the state doesn't really have a way to give us $10 million. Um, uh, we have the process by which we explain our budget and justify it and the money is allocated for those purposes as we spend it. It's like we spend it and we have authorization to spend it. I think that's how it works. So it's sort of a combination of the normal administrative review, which we must um, follow, I and mean, then how the money kind of moves around um, in the state from the general fund. I could, I could still be getting it wrong, but that's how I see it sort of structurally working. Um, uh, just to, um, it's not that, you know, that, that anyway, that's how I see it's actually working. So, um, Mr. Sultani and Mr. Laird, um, I'd like to invite you to, um, respond, please. Thank you. Sure thing. I'll, I'll start and then, uh, Phil, if you want to, uh, follow up as well. So first off, I appreciate the input from the board and, uh, especially around the public awareness efforts. Um, as Mr. Laird mentioned, we do have funds encumbered for uh, media buy. We did that last year and we uh, actually used some of those funds in advance of our um, uh, hearings for rulemaking to solicit broad awareness of our agency and solicit public comment on the rulemaking. And I think that helped contribute to the robust feedback we received as part of the rulemaking uh, hearings um, during the first package. Um, we do expect to continue to um, utilize and focus on public awareness, including expenditure of funds. Um, we've had, as you know, some challenges bringing on our public affairs and building that team. And so we expect to potentially contract for additional resources to help us develop the materials uh, and the, and the you know, um, the PSAs, as Mr. McTaggart describes, and the kind of the content to help promote, um, since we don't have that expertise of, say, videographers and, and um, content creators in-house. Um, so that is going to be a fu function moving forward, including um, this fiscal year. Um, with regards to the um, kind of how the uh, appropriation, uh, Ms. Ch Ms. Urban is right, is that it are you know, there's there's two pieces, which is, is, is our appropriation and then our spending authority. And our spending authority essentially goes through the state process, either by the creation of personnel count, which is what I highlighted in my recommendation, or, you know, by procurement, the standard procurement process. So if we wanted, were to solicit a uh, public awareness um, contract for uh, perhaps someone uh, like of the sort that Mr. McTaggart referenced, we have to go through the state process. We have to go through the, the procurement process as we are doing for the strategic planning process. Uh, and that involves uh, coordination with the Department of Finance and the Department of General Services. Um, so uh, so, so uh, with regards to our appropriation, um, indeed, uh, and, and uh, our statute indicates that that uh, appropriation can be adjusted or, or is adjusted for cost of living. Uh, but the process by which that happens is what we're talking about. It doesn't, the number doesn't magically, dynamically um, kind of change every time you reload the page on the, the you know, Secretary of State website. We have to go through and um, uh, request that revision. And I outlined one process, which I understand that standard 26 is what the form is called to request that the Department of Finance revise that. And they need, that needs to go through a review and justification process, which we will cite the statute as that justification and request it. And I um, defer to Phil as to, uh, Mr. Laird as to um, the likelihood, but it is in statute as Mr. McTaggart highlighted, and we can do that. And I've also said that Department of Finance, we previous to this conversation, even in December, we've already spoken with the um, Department of Finance with regards to that um, adjustment. And they have indicated that at which point we need the expenditures uh, or at which point we would like the expenditures, we can request it and they will accommodate back years. So I don't think it's a it's an issue of um, that we will get it. It's an issue of essentially when and why. And I think um, to Mr. Lay's point, we were um, maintaining our, uh, our, our priorities under our existing allocation. We can certainly request that our allocation be expanded or our appropriation, sorry, is the right, is the right term, be expanded even today, and we can begin that process, but there is a review process. And then in addition, there's a review process on the actual expenditures. 
Um, Mr. Laird, do you want to correct me if I got any of that wrong or, or add, add on to that? Um, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I was thinking about it. I don't know if I have much more to add. I think that's pretty much correct. Um, you know, I think to uh, Mr. McTaggart's point, I think our law does lay out a uh, clear appropriation that uh, adds in sort of that COLA adjustment. And so, um, but to the point of how we balance uh, the appropriation that ends up in our budget worth you know, with the expenditures that we we are requesting through the BCP process or other processes you've, processes you've described, um, you know, I, I understand there there can be a calculation there, but um, no, I, I, at this point, I can't say I have, I have anything more to add. But happy to answer questions if there are some. Thank you, Mr. Laird. So, as I understand it, um, I would like to just highlight for the group and circle back to Mr. Uh, part of Mr. Lay's point, which I understood to be. Um, a board member um, discussion of um, priorities and um, things to take into account. And so Mr. Lay and Mr. McTaggart both mentioned public awareness as a priority. Mr. Lay, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you mentioned the current um, challenging state budget environment as part of the information um, that the board might want to take into account in terms of uh, if we were to kick off this process this year or how much we would um, much we would this year that because those kinds of considerations, of course, also um, are relevant to, um, to 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 what we ask staff to do with regards to process. It's not a question, again, of whether the money will be available for us um, when we spend it, when we need to spend it. It's a question of what's the timing and sort of what's the process. Um, and, and I just want to check with Mr. Lay to see if I mangled <laughs> too much um, what he meant to convey and then go to Ms. De La Torre. Yeah, and I think that's right. You know, I, I think Mr. McTaggart has a great point. You know, if the agency has the funds available, we should try our best to use it in, in accordance with, um, you know, what, what was passed by the voters. Um, and, and I think going forward, you know, that makes sense. And I think the reason why I'm not as opposed to not taking the full allocation this year is one, that the money is available if we need it. Two, there is, there is funding available quite a bit for public outreach and awareness. You know, I think I'm just waiting for the person to be hired so we can begin to use that. And finally, I think the last, you know, by the least concern, but it's still a big one is, you know, when the agency goes into this budget hearing and oversight that you know the, the agency can say you know we are being a responsible steward of funds um and but yes so what you said was 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 correct um and i i'm not against what mr mctaggart's point is i do i do think he, he raises a good one uh and i'm just a little bit relieved that you know if the money is if we do need the money it will be available as we are not hamstringing ourselves in the future by this year not taking the full amount. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Yes, um, big question for me from our last discussion was, would we be leaving money on the table in the future? And so I'm pleased that that we would not be. Um, Ms. De La Torre, please go ahead. Thank you. It seems to me that we're having two conversations at the same time. One is how the money should be spent and the other one is how much money we should request. I do not believe, I think Mr. McTaggart um, is right. I do not believe that we should, as the board, or frankly, the staff of the agency should substitute our judgment for the judgment of the voters who approve the proposal. And so there is no reason in my mind why we shouldn't request what the law states that we should obtain. I understand that there is a process. It, maybe there are ways in which we disallocated um, by law could be reduced that I'm not aware of or have not been part of the discussion. But to start the process by not asking what was allocated by law seems to me that will be negligent on our end, considering the, um, the, the rights and interests that we have been created to support. Um, so, so that said, I also wanted to mention that the, this is a little bit of a complicated conversation and I don't know that I'm grasping all of the administrative steps here. I know that uh, Chairperson Urban is probably more <laughs> adept at all of these because he had to deal with it at the beginning of the process. But uh, I, I, I think that we should leave leeway to the staff of the agency in determining 
what is it that um, needs to be, um, you know, that the money can be dedicated to I support public awareness. There might be other pieces. Um, once we end this conversation on how much, which I think to me what Mr. McTaggart proposes is what the law says and it's what should be done. Maybe we can have a little bit of a conversation on um, for what purposes. Um, and I, I know that it has been mentioned that um, we will apparently not put ourselves in a position where we will be missing out on the increase in future years, which was a question in my mind as, as well. But it is clear to me that we're missing out on what has been allocated this year and last year. And nobody's gonna return that um, budget to us. So it just, again, seems to me that what the law says is what should be requested by the agency. And I um, understand that there are processes to correct the current um, proposal to uh, adjust it so that we can do so, which, which I will support. Thank you, Ms. Dale, that's right. Mr. McTaggart. So I have a comment, but before that, I just have a question based on what um, member De La Torre just said, which do I understand it correctly? When you say they'll catch up in the future, they will allocate whatever the COLA has come, but do we get, have we lost the funds from last year? They just go to say, okay, well, this is what the inflation rate would be in 23, 24. So we'll pay you that, but you're out the 22, 23 that you didn't ask for. We, we didn't get into that level of specificity since we didn't articulate what the request would be, but we can, we can certainly identify that. My understanding of general uh, and why it was so important that we, for example, undertake the public awareness um, contract last year uh, with the help of Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson was that any fund, w w so funds that are not spent by the agency return back to the general fund. There's no kind of piggy bank that we store and maintain funds um, with one exception, which we had a kind of a, um, an initial setup of the agency. We had a special fund um, that we still have some um, small amounts of, of um, uh, allocation in or appropriation in. But generally, um, I don't, un, I'm, I, and, I, and again, I'm happy to go and check and then report back on this question uh, after both consulting with finance as well as what we've done is, you know, consult with other agencies to see how this is done typically. Um, but for the 21-22 year, uh, for the 3.7 per, uh, you know, percent adjustment in that year, which would roughly be $370,000. I don't know if we can request the back year of those funds. I think what we can do is request the adjustment that incorporates that the, the moment the adjustment is made, it incorporates you know, the 3.7 and the 7.3, or I'm sorry, I might be butchering those numbers. I have to look back to my, my notes, but essentially the compound of those two. Does well. that make sense? It, it does. It, 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 it to me is very worrying. Um, again, when I and I remember writing this paragraph to be as clear as possible because I did not want the legislature to be able to play games with the agency funding, knowing how powerful tech is and knowing how much you know influence business does have over the legislative process. I wanted to make it crystal clear that no matter who was in power, no matter how they felt about privacy, this agency was going to get funded, no matter what. And now. I feel like we may have given up hundreds of thousands of dollars that we may never get back. And I feel like we're kind of being, I mean, to use the member dilatory's word, we're, we're playing with negligence here about not getting the maximum that we are entitled to by law. And, you know, if you want to talk about stewardship, our stewardship is we are a tiny little agency facing the most powerful industry that the world has ever seen in terms of money and influence and reach. And, uh, you know, there are more uh, resources on the other side and not that it's an antagonistic relationship, but we certainly need to put rules of the road in place. We need to have some eventual enforcement. And right now there's an unlimited demand. If you could talk to the average Californian to say, what's the CPPA? They'll look at you and just kind of shake their head. So it doesn't take you know, months and months to get an ad out, uh, to put it on the radio. Uh, Ashkan, you could, uh, Mr. Sultana, you, you could record it yourself. 
and, and put it on the radio and sort of say, hey, if you have a question, come to our website. So I just feel like this is sort of a fire here. I want to make sure that we get the maximum dollars. I'd, I, I think we should absolutely try to go back to, to the extent that we for, for we, we missed out on, on, on funding that we were entitled to. We should go back and try to make a strong case for that. Maybe that ship has sailed, but I certainly don't want to see us do this anymore. Thanks, Mr. McTaggart. I also, I just wanted to point out that before the board had its first meeting with help from staff, I directed several million dollars into an architectural revolving fund, um, which is one of the few ways that you can preserve money. Um, uh, given that we have to spend it to get it. Um, so um, through the through the administrative process and sort of constraints of the way the system works. So we do have our architectural revolving fund um, in place as well. Um, Mr. Sultani, um, I'm assuming that what you want to say is directly responsive. And then Mr. Lee, thank you for your patience. Thank you. I just wanted to um, uh, offer uh, uh, some additional viewpoints and just make one correction or I know it's not a correction, but it's not it's not even so much spend it to get it, it's spend it to keep it. So essentially, uh, the, for example, we expect a, um, a budget surplus this year, given that we've been unable to, to hire at the speed that we'd like. State hiring is very difficult. I'm happy to share my experience here, but we've, we've hired from you know, zero to or one to 25 in, in about a year's time. Um, and I expect, uh, and hope, you know, we, we're trying to get up to our um, kind of expected uh, complement, as I said, but we're not near there. Uh, and therefore we have another, we expect to have a budget surplus this year. And similar to last year, we would like to potentially um, direct those funds for additional public awareness efforts. In this case, as I said, um, the state contracting process for those, uh, for those types of services takes roughly about six months, um, which we're behind the ball on. But um, last year we were able to um, do a narrowed contract for um, our previous budget surplus to do media buys since it's a more expedited contracting process. And this year I'd like to go through a somewhat longer contracting process to get resources, as I said, to um, uh, focus on the content creation for those those pieces. Uh, Alistair, uh, I appreciate your, or Mr. Geiger, I appreciate your confidence in me recording, but you know, I think we'd like to make sure that we not only um, provide kind of high quality uh, materials, but also in multiple languages, you know, to represent the diverse uh, people in California. So we'd need translation services and all the full gamut. Um, and so we, I only go down this tangent to indicate that, um, for example, were we to uh, have requested the, the um, approximate $370,000 in um, 2122, we would essentially only be able to keep that money uh, in either by uh, um, encumbering it through a co contract for a specific person purpose uh, or through the architectural revolving fund that uh, Chair Urban uh, um, highlighted, which we already have and was created at the creation of the agency. Um, you know, I wish spending were um, quicker and uh, faster, but I admit it's one of the most difficult um, uh, components of the state process, um, particularly because we have a number of control agencies as a small agency, but also as any agency in California to, um, to actually spend that, those funds. And I think the best use of those funds, uh, future looking, um, as I laid out, would be to start um, uh, requiring, uh, requesting personnel authority in future years because we expect the agency to grow and with our key areas of the agency, such as um, uh, auditing and, and consumer complaints that we wanna uh, request personnel authority, essentially uh, the ability to hire and pay staff uh, and then use the surplus funds that we expect to have in this budget year for things like public awareness and encumber those um, for uh, approximately two years to, to the completion of those contracts. Um, so that, I just wanted to add, add kind of that perspective, but I, but I, I hear the board. Um, I certainly don't want, uh, you know, if the board's direction is to not leave any money on the table, I, I hear, I hear you. The challenge is that the money goes off the table unless it's, um, spent and the spending of, you know, I, we joke and the inside joke with staff is buying the printers. You know, it, it, I would love to be able to walk down to the, um, electronic store and purchase a printer, but it takes months and months to go through that process. and a lot of staff time and we're doing it as kind of as quickly as we can. 
Thank you, Mr. Sultani. And again, I just really want to commend you and staff on how quickly you've managed to hire as many people as you have, because of course our main expense is people. Um, and the main reason that um, we've been under budget is because we're busy trying to add people. Um, uh, and I also appreciate your correction. You're right, it's spend it to keep it more, more than anything else um, uh, under the budget process, which, you know, I it is slow. It is just slow and it can be frustrating, particularly as we are trying to grow and fulfill our mission for Californians. It's also, of course, important. This, are Cal this is California's money. It's not our money. Um, and um, all of those processes, as frustrating and slow as they may be, and the fact that I per certainly share Mr. McTaggart's frustration that like, we couldn't just keep what was left of our $5 million in that first year. Those are all um, important processes to make sure that the money is spent transparently and with proper state oversight. Um, Mr. Lay, and then um, Ms. De La Torre, no, sorry, Mr. McTaggart, and then Ms. De La Torre. Yeah, and um, I just, I have a question and I guess a comment. I'll, I'll start with the comment first. And yeah, and, and to Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Uh, McTaggart's points, you know, it is rare that an agency doesn't ask for all of the money it's entitled to. I, I don't think, you know, that's very popular in government. Um, I, I think it, it does a disservice to the agency if we had a use for it and we didn't take it. Um, so that, that's why I said, you know, in generally going forward in the future, I, I'd like to uh, encumber or use all that money if possible. It, I just want to acknowledge it is a unique situation that the the agency is in considering how early it is that it, it's just hard to spend that much money with you know 24 people um and, and no office but beyond that i think um you know one consideration is as far as i know you know the the 10 million plus the cost of living increase is you know the the minimum we can require we can ask for if we need it um but i thought and, and correct me if i'm wrong um uh, mr sultani or mr laird but if the agency wanted to go be a, a beyond that, you know, 11.18 million that we're, you know, maximally entitled to, we could, right? Um, and that that is a question. Like, if there were legal reasons or like enforcement needs, we could go beyond that number uh, if we could prove it to, you know, the, the Department of Finance. Is that correct or no? And 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 my thought is that, you know, if we're going under this year, but we have to go over our statutory allotment, then, you know, this could be some sort of credit to the Senate or, you know, our oversight folks. But um, just, just, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on that, if that's true or not. It's absolutely true. Again, it's in the statute, but it's also always true. That's how state agencies get their money. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, Mr. Lay, and also that you pointed out something I meant to point out earlier, which is, and I pointed out in our last discussion of this, which is, um, this is a slightly frustrating situation. It is very time limited. Um, it is time limited because it is created by the fact that we are growing as fast as we can. Um, and it is not gonna be very long at all before we have no trouble um, with how we're gonna spend our full appropriation, which means that you know the justifications and everything that we need to do will be straightforward to make. Um, and the only question in my mind very soon is going to be when we request more than that statutory allocation, because we have a lot of work to do. And we have an incredibly effective staff that's been growing really fast given the constraints. Um, so we are, this is a time limited situation. And I just really wanna appreciate um, that Mr. Lay sort of highlighted that this is unusual um, and also um, mentioned the fact that it's not a ceiling in, I mean, we have a specific appropriation from the people of California, um, but we also, of course, if needed, um, can request more than that, and then that is more discretionary on the part of the legislature, so thank you. Um, Mr. Sultani, um, did you have anything you wanted to add in terms of um, yeah. Mr. Lay's question? Indeed, um, that's a, uh, thank you for Mr. Lay for, for asking that question. That's a great question and a great point. I may have not been clear to, to indicate in my kind of in the beginning of my presentation on the budget, which is that the expected um, request, the current BCP of seven staff, five in enforcement and two IT um, would put us at the 
essentially at our $10 million appropriation. Um, and, and that's with five enforcement staff. And so, and that um, includes kind of existing um, forecasts on spend for contracting for things like IT services and um, things like, uh, gov, you know, uh, GovLaw, DOJ services, but it does not um, project, for example, the bulk of our public uh, um, awareness contracting efforts forward looking in future years because um, of the need for essentially the one, because we have some uh, already encumbered and two, that we expect that we will grow in that function both in-house um, and uh, importantly, and I think the point that you were trying to make is that um, that we expect to, to if we go in future years for needs for things like our public awareness function or additional staff resources for enforcement or whatever else function that the board wants to direct us to, we will need to go to Department of Finance and request that appropriation over our 10 million plus cost of living uh, adjustment um, uh, appropriation. And so the part of the sensitivity in this discussion is also that if we are not seen as fiscally responsible and we essentially uh, um, heavily uh, push the issue of the cost of living adjustment with the Department of Finance and get into an adversarial uh, relationship, then in, in, in very soon, actually, in the, almost in the immediate next year, when we request to go over the cost of living adjustment, uh, then there might there will be pushback, I suspect, or there could be pushback on letting the agency grow. And so, typically, I, I, it might not be clear, but we, you know, most agencies either through um, just standard growth, or as I said, we're going to forecast what our enforcement complexity and as well as the number of consumer complaints we receive in order to then go back to the Department of Finance in future years and say, no, perhaps we need more attorneys in enforcement to actually undertake our mission, or no, perhaps we need more employees in public awareness, or we need more contracting budget in public awareness to achieve our mission. And we make that case to Department of Finance and they approve. And so my worry is that they could say, no, you're limited to your cost of living adjustment that's built into that statute. And that's the only increase we'll give you, including in future years, where um, the cost of living is not that significant as it has been in the past two years. So um, I think that's an important point, which is that we this, the, this kind of plan is not just about leaving money on the table. Today, when we're small, we are essentially limited in our ability to spend, but also forward-looking in our ability to request further funds from the legislature as we need to fulfill our mission. So um, I hope that, that was clear, but that's kind of the, what we're, we're thinking about in the back of our heads as well. Thanks so much, Mr. Zoltani. And that reminds me of Mr. McTaggart's point about sort of our earlier budget allocations and my point that we haven't had the people. Um, so, you know, we've been a little limited for a limited point of time. Um, along with Ms. De La Torre's, I think, really important point earlier in the discussion about um, uh, uh, providing the staff with the guidance needed for staff to expertise, staff's expertise to be deployed here. Um, so I'm just going to say this and then say staff will be able to, you know, decide whether I'm wrong about this. But it does seem to me that in these future years, a strong justification is the fact that we were under budget for the first couple of years for by ever, however much, right? So we didn't even spend our full allocation by whatever it ends up being a million dollars. And um, we are now asking for it at this point in time. That seems like a very reasonable um, support for that request. Um, and I will just leave it to, I, and I apologize if that is not an appropriate um, uh, kind of um, justification. It, it just seems as though um, it is to me, and that may be a way to alleviate the, the um, reasonable worries that Mr. McTaggart has um, about not getting the um, the people of California not having the advantage of the full amount that they allocated um, for us at the beginning, if that makes sense. Okay, Mr. McTaggart and then Ms. De La Torre, who's been very patient. Well, I, I think we're conflating a couple of things because in the future, if we wanna go over our uh, allocation, which is in the statute is, is obviously we can, we're not going to go to the Department of Finance. You got to go to the budget. You got to go to appropriates. You got to go through the Assembly. You got to go through the Senate, and you're back into the world of normal politics. The notion that 
giving up on money now is necessarily going to win us friends in the future somewhere in that whole process. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Who knows? But what I know for sure is we're giving up and we gave up money now in the hope of something in the future. And generally, you know, I think that's a bad bet to make because, you know, the political process going through the budget process in California is a fraught political process. Now, maybe we get some huge settlement and they'll say, great, you guys are doing good things. Or maybe, you know, they'll they'll be moved one way or another. But we're back out there. We're fighting with other people for budget allocation at that point. This is guaranteed budget allocation. And it is crazy to me that we would think about giving up on guaranteed budget allocation for a hope and a belief that in the future we'll be treated well to get more when we have no indication that we will. And no one has ever said, oh, yeah, by the way, here's why, here's, we will give you more in the future. So I come back to this sort of responsible stewardship and this notion of fiscal responsibility. You, you talk about fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility is us getting what we uh, are not, not deserve, what we are required to get under the law of California. That it's, it, this is a legal thing. This isn't even a, this isn't a, I don't think we have the authority to ask for less. And they don't have the authority to give us this. And this shouldn't be like, oh, you're playing nice in the sandbox because you asked for what the people of California, how can they be angry at us when we just show them the statute and say, you have, you owe us this. It, it, it's not even an issue. It's like, it's a speed limit. They have to give it to us. So I, I'm, I'm kind of unhappy that we're budgeting, asking for staff to get us to 10 million we have this wonderful ability to spend kind of as much as extra as we have on this unlimited public demand for you know education. So we could spend you know hundreds of millions of dollars to educate people about their privacy rights. Obviously, we're not going to. We don't have that kind of money. But the kinds of money we're talking about, and given what I just said about the California Broadcasters Association having a PSA program, you know, we just need to have a contract to spend the money. And okay, if the contract takes longer to get approved great but we can allocate the money we can fund the money we can say here it is waiting to be funded well then let's get it let's find someone who we can spend the money on a on a program to there's i i, I would we have had a year if we didn't know that we were going to have an excess we're going we are not treating our money well and there's got to be a way we can spend this money because we've known about it for a year that we were either going to have a surplus or we're going to have a need for it. And we should have some kind of a contract which we can adjust to spend the money as we have it. But we just cannot be walking away from hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm very distressed about this. Thank you so much, Mr. McTaggart. So I actually think that we are moving towards um, something that could solidify into helpful direction for the staff. I'd like to ask Ms. De La Torre um, for her comment, and then I will summarize what I think I understand and um, offer my proposal there. Uh, right, so I think that we are all in agreement in terms of how to move forward in the future, which will be request the full allocated amount. And going back to this then possible recover whatever is it that can be recovered from the budget years where that request was not made. I was just hoping to move the conversation to um, the specifics that were mentioned um, as to how the money was allocated or you know what, what should be requested in terms of the staff. There's one comment from the executive director that I wanted to circle back to if that's possible. Could I do so, uh, Mr. Mrs. Chairperson, or should you take? Uh, I think, well, that's a specific question. So maybe let's ask Mr. Sultani to answer. Um, and everything you're saying is aligned with what I'm thinking. So I'll just slot that into the framework and then offer what I, I'm thinking in a moment. Okay, perfect. So I think uh, Mr. Sultani mentioned among the ideas for uh, future budget allocation the fact that. Um, we as all agencies in California by law are required to use the AG uh, for um, litigation. So if there is a case that goes to litigation, enforcement case, for example, it will be the AG defending that case um, as, the law it is, uh, as the law is right now. I believe Mr. Sultani mentioned the idea of 
requesting an exemption from that requirement. Some agencies in California do have this where you can internally in the agency have your own litigation staff and then that litigation staff will defend your cases. I just want to circle back to Mr. Sultanian and just um, check with him if I understood this correctly. Thank you, Lydia. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, no, am I okay to respond? No worries. Sure. Yes, please sure. go ahead. So, Thanks, Mr. Great. Mr. great. I was actually I was just going to tap tap in Mr. Laird because it's it's almost right. So it's a, it's a little bit nuanced. Uh, Phil, would you like to, Mr. Laird, would you like to um, take that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, to what Mr. Sultani uh, suggested earlier, basically we're, what we have in mind is is more or less actually Ms. Dilatory, what you described. Um, is a sort of limited exemption that would allow um, from, from existing law, which is this general premise that the Attorney General's Office represents uh, sort of all state departments for not just only uh, judicial proceedings, but also administrative proceedings. Um, knowing that our administrative proceedings um, are going to go through the Office of Administrative Hearings and then end up before this board, we thought that was a practical sort of venue for our own enforcement division to be able to sort of Kind of own and control their cases to be able to investigate and then also be the the representing party uh, in those administrative proceedings specifically um, for all other sort of instances and if for instance somebody appeals a decision after the board renders one and we end up in superior court or beyond that is something where we would still then work with the attorney general's office to be the representatives of our agency but uh, for our administrative proceedings there's really a model for that and other plenty of other departments um, in fact, the Department of Cannabis Control just got this exact exemption we're talking about um, specifically for administrative proceedings so that their attorneys could, could um, uh, represent the agency. And, and we really do, uh, as much as there's an efficiency argument for it, we also see this directly related as a cost savings measure um, because uh, we, you do pay for the Attorney General's representation uh, for work that our attorneys, we think, will be capable of doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me repeat back to make sure that I understood. So what we're saying is that we will have our own team um, dealing with all of the litigation up to the administrative process. But if something goes to court, it will be the AG, right? Is that, is that correct? That, that's correct. That's okay. Correct. And I'm glad to hear that. that because separate, I'm sorry. That is separately no. split in the statute that okay. they have civil authority. We have administrative authority. I think, as I understand it, this is just the question of how our administrative authority is exercised with people from right. the attorney general's office or with our own people. Okay, so I appreciate uh, Mr. Layer providing the clarification. I will not be supportive of switching to um, you know request the exception so that we could, I mean, I will listen to the arguments, but it seems to me that the AG is very well prepared to defend our cases before court and, and we should take advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, okay, so um, that is a slight, so that is a, um, a different, um, slight, slight, let, me, let me offer my sort of framework. Um, that's a detail that um, I hadn't worked in um, to the framework, and I'm not sure that I agree actually in this territory, but um, I would have to listen and think about it a little bit. Um, but um, so as I am listening to the board discussion and I'm putting that together with options um, that we have in the budget process now and um, what we could do to direct the staff, um, I agree with Ms. De La Torre that there's general agreement on the board um, that we want to be able to use the resources allocated to us by Californians um, on behalf of Californians, um, and that we are at a moment in the budget process where um, using the May revise or the standard something or the, sorry, apologies, the spring BCP, there are a couple of different options. Let me keep talking because I, you'll pick the right one. Um, that we could revise our request um, so that the request encompasses um, our full statutory appropriation, including cost of living increases for this year. Um, so that is one part. And then the second part would be um, direction 
um, from the board in terms of how we would like staff um, to allocate additional money, what are our values and our priorities. Um, we've certainly um, agreed on public awareness. Um, I know, uh, Mr. Sultani, um, you mentioned um, some additional positions with regards to enforcement and audit team, I think. Um, and we haven't really picked that up, but I would, I would, um, I would um, very much take sort of staff's direction on this um, as you are thinking about carefully building out all of our capacities, um, especially, you know, as the board will need to be screened to some degree from the day to day enforcement as we will be the decision makers. So I personally would probably um, let staff know that we care about public enforcement. We also care, excuse me, public awareness. We also care about building enforcement and ask you all to allocate um, uh, according to your judgment. Um, but that, so that's like my basic understanding. Um, there is this additional wrinkle as to how we would um, uh, staff um, administrative procedures, which Ms. De La Torre just brought up. Um, so I want to recognize that that is there. We haven't discussed it in much detail um, and find out um, where the board sort of is on the general sort of framework so that we can come to something that helps the staff take next steps. Ms. De La Torre? No, I think that you don't need to go back to the question. I think that Mr. Sultani and Mr. Lair solved it. I, I think I'm supportive. I just um, heard it and I think I understood something different from what it was meant. I, I'm very supportive of um, the proposal. Uh, the one only thing that I wanted to add is in terms of uh, priorities for spending. To me, they are very tied to our priorities for the agency and thus I understand a process that's still ongoing. So um, I think that it is appropriate for the staff to right now, you know, take the lead based on our conversations and, and their needs. But at some point we need to have that priorities conversation and, and, and tie the budget to the priorities that we set as a board. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And just for everyone's edification, for particularly the public who are maybe here in December, we have a regularized sort of um, calendar and plan um, and we will have a priorities discussion um, when we start taking up the next budget. Um, it will also, um, hopefully very soon, be moving in strategic planning, which will help um, illuminate all of that. Um, I should um, clarify that for what I was setting out here was for purposes of the current budget process um, with regards to what we would like to authorize and um, direct staff to do. Um, and one component of it, I think, um, is the COLA. And then the second component would be general, you know, our thoughts and guidance on how that additional money might be spent. Um, I certainly support Ms. De La Torre, um, Ms. De La Torre's um, a thought of giving staff, you know, the, um, the that staff should um, should be applying their expertise um, to 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 this in any at any level of detail. I just wanted to be sure to reflect what I was hearing um, from the board in terms of um, priorities the board would like the staff to take into account at least. Um, thank you. Okay, Ms. Dela, sorry, Mr. McTaggart. Thanks. Well, you know, as long as we are committed to um, obtaining our 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 um, amount due this year through whatever the process is, a revise the ST, whatever, uh, that's fine. I would also like to request that we ask for the money that we should have gotten, and then if we don't get that, uh, I'd like a report back on how much we didn't get if we if we uh, if we don't get it. Um, and, uh, then presumably we can use that as this bargaining chip in the future and say, well, we should have gotten that, but I'd like to, I'd like to ask for it as well. So whatever money we, we didn't get for the last couple of years. Um, and then I, I would like to, you know, I, I, I feel like it's staff to decide whether we spend X on public outreach and how they spend it and whether they ask for extra enforcement people that is actually what Mr. Sultani's kind of responsibility is. And I feel like I'm, that would be micromanaging to say, spend this or that. My only point is, I think we have an unlimited demand on the public side of things. So I'd like to fi find out also what's the constraint in getting that money spent 
um, and whether, and again, I've, I've, I've been in conversations with some people who are uh, kind of, um, who have asked me why we haven't used this public service announcement, or I don't know if we are, or if we have plans to uh, process, because apparently that's what a lot of other state agencies do do, and there's no markup, and that's a, obviously a good stewardship issue as, uh, as well with respect to our funding, and, and I feel like um, if this vehicle exists, and I don't know if it takes months and months to get approved, or if it, if it exists with this public service announcement program with the California Broadcast Association with no markup, we should be taking advantage of it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, I, I had a question is, I, I'm curious to how much funding we have encumbered for public, uh, you know, these public education. Um, and, and I'll note, you know, with the departure of Mr. Thompson, the there is an opening in the public awareness committee, a subcommittee um, with, with me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm waiting eagerly for the hire for public affairs. And then I will, I will take responsibility for um, perhaps there not being very much action on the public awareness while that hire is, is happening because, uh, you know, I haven't really been pushing it without Mr. Thompson. Um, so I'll, I'll just note that. But yeah, if, if we could have, um, if, if Mr. Sultani or Mr. Laird know how much we have encumbered already for um, public awareness, that'd be helpful. And, and I'll note for the, the, the campaign that we did do, um, I believe we used uh, some of the methods that Mr. McTaggart mentioned where th there was no markup um, for, the, for the broadcasts. No, so Mr. Sultani, you know the amount we have encumbered. Please let me know. If you don't, uh, we can come back. Sure. I, 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 I don't know the exact amount. I can um, get get um, get those figures, but it's pretty close to what we we only spent about a fraction, about I want to say an eighth of what we originally encumbered, which was I believe something like um, uh, uh, seven point nine million is what we may have uh, encumbered. And that's for media buy, and so we can use that, and we plan to use that um, very soon, as soon as we have the public affairs person um, onboarded, um, and uh, and and really, you know, once we're particularly um, the timing should hopefully work well because once our um, rules are finalized, uh, or uh, assuming our rules are finalized, we can also more um, uh, accurately communicate what the rights and responsibility or what the rights and protections Californians have are at, at that point. Um, I can get to you those exact numbers if it's helpful. Um, uh, and I do, as I mentioned, um, and to Mr. McTaggart's point, very, um, and we are currently also working on um, a contract to essentially, um, that contract was for media buy um, and that, those funds are encumbered for media buy. We're also essentially looking to contract for media production or content creation, you know, utilizing the expertise of the agency, but also someone that can essentially develop a campaign, make sure it reaches the broad um, kind of constituents of California, make sure it's on on message with our agency and help to help us develop that content, hopefully um, with the board's input. So those two pieces um, uh, are underway. I can, I'm happy to, re to re either report back generally. I think those, those figures are well, actually just just uh, yeah I believe that figure is um, somewhere uh, I can report back the exact I don't want to I don't want to guess but it's yeah, around fine. what I what I yeah yeah okay and well, then, uh, thanks Mr. Salai yeah. Mr. Lay does that answer your question yeah I just wanted to get a ballpark and that's yeah. that's fine with me yeah it's a generous amount yes. Um, yes and it's a generous proportion of our overall yearly spend um so I think it's very helpful to know that we have that um, available to us um, for, for media buys um, at this moment and that it is encumbered for us. Um, so let me um, circle back um, around. Um, so I think that we have consensus um, to request um, that staff um, go back and um, request the full allocation with the COLA um, and um, that the board is generally in agreement that we um, we would ask staff to exercise judgment in terms of how exactly you allocate that, um, you know, broadly what our values are, and they're also set out in the statute, um, and to just come back with a, to us if you need to, um, but um, I think that is the plan. Now, Mr. McTaggart also asked about the 
kind of request to go back um, further, like to the, to the first year, because the second year we have encumbered everything we didn't spend, right, um, pretty much. So, um, and then in terms of that, um, what I would suggest is um, that staff um, understand that they have direction for sure to explore this um, and possibilities. Um, it just may be a challenge for this budget cycle, but staff should explore it um, and move as uh, aggressively as possible. And then if we can also revisit when we talk about the next fiscal budget. Um, I just want to be sure that we're not asking for something impossible um, at this time. Mr. McTaggart. Sorry, I, I might have missed a, a word there, but I, I, I heard the let's ask for it. And then and then I, I heard you say give staff the ability to explore. I mean, again, I think it should be. Let me clarify. The board has um, has consensus that staff should ask for our full additive COLA compounded for this year. There's also the question of money that reverted to the general fund in the first year. The second year, I believe is all encumbered for public awareness. Um, that second amount of money, um, it would be, it's unusual, <laughs> it just never happens. So what I was going to say is that, um, you know, I'm happy to support staff exploring that for sure. I just don't want us to direct staff to do something when we don't exactly understand what the implications are for this budget cycle. To they, they should look into it and, and do their best. And then um, we definitely should also revisit it with the next budget cycle um, with staff's understanding and sort of research in hand. So that's what I'm saying. There's two separate pieces. Ms. De La Torre? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I, I didn't get a chance to make my point. Um, and uh, so as I understand it, you said the first, the second year, and again, I'd like to know if that was, if we asked for the amount or if we, 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 we didn't get our maximum. Um, and then, you know, going back to asking for the money that we're going to, that we're due this year, you know, we were able to have an board. I, I was not on the board there, but the, the board did have an emergency board meeting uh, last summer when ADPPA was up and had a big you know, uh, a session and ended up writing a letter uh, and voting on 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 opposing ADPPA. And I would say this is at the same level. If, if, if we get back negative response from some Department of Finance person who says, well, we're not going to give this to you, I would want to have a, a, a emergency board meeting to say, well, wait, we need to uh, explore options here. Because again, there's not a lot of, when I look at this, this is cut and dried. So I, I think that um, I'm happy to have this be through whatever proposal that we we go from 10 to 11.18, but we need to get to the 11.18. Okay, so the 11.18 is not a question. Um, okay, um, the, the question in terms of just timing would be going to back years um, and, um, and recouping money that had been revert, that had reverted to the general fund. And so what I'm hearing Mr. McTaggart is first of all, a request uh, for an accounting, so we know for sure. I mean, I can sort of only give ballparks a little bit, um, uh, but I know that that public awareness contract encumbered a lot. Um, and then with regards to the very, very first year, um, we should be able to um, find the numbers. And then secondly, find out if there's a mechanism in um, this budget year or a future budget year to request those funds so that they aren't lost to us. Um, and all I was saying for that second part, not the 11 point whatever COLA, but for that second part, I would really um, like staff to have discretion to research it and let us know what's possible rather than um, us necessarily saying you have to like do this just because I don't know exactly what the traps are um, for for the process. That, that So there are two separate things. Does Thank that make sense, Mr. McTaggart? Yes, thank you. Okay, good, great, thank you. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sultani, is it all right? Yeah, just... yeah, Ms. De La Torre. All right, I, I just think that, you know, when I hear Mr. McTaggart speak, it sounds really clear, but I then I get confused. So I think that what we need to do is identify the money that was not requested, that was lost because it was not requested. That's one bucket, right? And then there is another potential bucket of money that was requested but not spent. Is that is that correct? 
Yeah. So, so, so long as we have an, a general accounting of that, I think that, you know, we should leave to the agency to give us an understanding of what might be recoverable from that and, you know, make their best effort. Um, it was difficult the first two years, you know, we were all new. <laughs> I'm just, you know, if something was um, perhaps not, you know, requested that should have been, I just, uh, I'm very, um, aware of, of what um, our director faced when he was appointed. We, we didn't have a staff, you know, the, the process was so new. So I don't, I don't think that there is much use on going back to the past to, you know, identify who or, who, you know, what was not done. It's just more about, you know, if there's buckets in the past that we can identify that are recoverable, how do we get there? What is the best process to get there? Okay. Thanks, Ms. De La Troy. Um, the first year is weird because um, we were given, you know, we didn't have an advanced BCP. Um, we were allowed to file a BCP that just matched what we spent, again, because like we didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay, Mr. Sultani. Right. So we don't need to well, re-engineer a... any of that. It's just about, you know, identifying the accounting what recover. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the accounting point. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Sultani. I was just going to ask for clarification, but um, if, between the discussion between Ms. Delatore and you, I think I think we got it. I think uh, in terms of what the board wants, I'm happy to repeat it, or but I think we got it. we have it. Okay. All right. Um, so um, thank you very much, Mr. Sultani and Mr. Laird, um, for popping in to help us. Um, I believe that um, we have the board has provided um, its direction. And Mr. Sultani, um, do let us know if that did seem unclear. Um, I think we have a pretty straightforward um, set of tasks and um, thoughts that hopefully you can work with. I have uh, one point of, I apologize to jump in, sure. one point of clarification for Mr. Laird in response to Mr. McTaggart's um, question uh, regarding um, uh, if, if, if for some reason the Department of Finance um, uh, uh, it does not approve our, our revision request. Um, I believe we can stand, we can schedule a regular meeting of the board and we can do that quickly within 10 days. But I don't think we have the ability to do a um, special meeting or emergency meeting. Uh, but yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Laird, you can clarify, please. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to drop that. Yes, there's a list of, of topics we could call an emergency meeting for in the statute. I actually meant to ask the same question. Um, in response to Mr. McTiger, thank you. Mr. Laird? Um, if I recall correctly, I apologize, I don't have Bagley Keen open in front of me, I should. Um, I believe there is an opportunity to schedule a special meeting for litigation matters, not an emergency meeting. Um, and actually a special meeting is technically what the board called the uh, first time around. Um, so yes, we, we would explore that option if, if need be. Okay, but if it were just a matter of hearing something from the Department of Finance, we would need to just do the 10 days, right? Well, I, I won't ask you to put you on the spot, Mr. Laird, um, but instead suggest that um, that I take um, as part of my task to um, call for a board meeting as quickly as possible if something like that were to happen. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Sabo, um, uh, I would like to give the public an opportunity to comment on this agenda item if they would like. Um, would you please call for public comment? Yes, we are on agenda item four, budget update and priorities for spring 2023. If you'd like to make a comment on agenda item four, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. So either Zoom's raise hand feature or star nine on your phone. This is for agenda item four, budget update and priorities for spring 2023. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, all right, um, I really thank the board um, for robust discussion 
and to the staff for providing us with, um, I think, very helpful sort of framework and also very helpful detail um, on what is a fairly complicated process. Um, and I think that we have been able um, to give the staff um, sufficient guidance um, to move forward um, with the budget process this year. And we'll look forward to hearing back anything from them on that and also to um, our meeting on setting priorities um, for the next year, which will come up sooner than you think. Um, so thanks very much um, to everyone for, for the input and for the discussion. And with that, um, let's go ahead and move on. Um, actually, let me just pause since we've been meeting for about two hours. Does anybody need a break or shall we just keep going? Okay, Mr. McTaggart, are you good? Great, thank you. Um, let's move on um, to agenda item number five. Um, agenda item number five will be presented by our general counsel, Mr. Philip Laird, and it's a topic to discuss our practices related to um, subcommittees, um, which um, is um, another place in which we've done our best um, with what we had. And, I, um, and um, this is an opportunity to um, think through and regularize our procedures. Um, before we get into the substance, um, I want to pause because I, I don't think that I've done this in a little while um, to thank to take this opportunity to thank board members for all the work that they've done through subcommittees over the last 18 to maybe 20 months. I mean, it's amazing to believe that's it. That's all the time that we're talking about here. Um, but it's been, um, you know, an intense amount of work to help get the agency up and running and move our crucial rulemaking work along, um, as well as other work while we were operating without staff and continuing to staff up. Um, now that we are um, uh, staffed um, fairly well and we have a rulemaking package under review with the Office of Administrative Law and additional topics out in our preliminary request for comments, um, it's an opportune time to discuss regularizing some of our subcommittee um, structures. Uh, for Mr. McTaggart's benefit, um, we have um, talked about um, having such a discussion in prior meetings. Um, for example, we discussed a timeline for disbanding the rulemaking subcommittees we set up um, for the rulemaking that just went to the Office of Administrative Law. Um, but we also have the um, automated decision making and other topics that um, are still underway. And we plan to pick up that issue um, when we had our first package in, which we do, so which is great. Um, so our general counsel um, has been um, carefully considering options and recommendations along with other staff um, in light of our discussions um, and in light of common practices and of course our very constant companion, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, um, which um, has a lot um, of um, sort of uh, parameters um, uh, with regards to subcommittees in particular. Um, so Mr. Laird has provided for us a short background memo with some recommendations. Um, with my thanks, Mr. Laird, um, I'd like to ask everyone to turn their attention to the memo, which is in your materials under agenda item number five, um, in case you'd like to refer to it while Mr. Laird um, walks us through, um, through it for us. And with that, um, I would like to turn it over to you, Mr. Laird. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, and I promise not to just read the memo word for word. I'll try to I'll try to hit on the highlights. Um, but as described um, in the meeting materials, um, staff have spent some time considering the agency's current subcommittee structures, uh, as well as those models employed by other similar boards of commissions, um, and is recommending a policy or what I actually might say is criteria really for how the board might create, maintain, and wind down subcommittees going forward. Um, the memo provided uh, gives background on how subcommittees can lawfully operate under the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, and then also describes the board's sort of specific history with subcommittees to date. Um, and then uh, the memo goes on to lay out the three most common types of subcommittees that we've observed in other state boards and commissions, uh, which I'll just very briefly describe right now. The first one is a ad hoc subcommittee, which are subcommittees that are temporary in nature, formed for the purpose of overseeing a specific issue or project task. 
Um, ad hoc subcommittees can be formed for a variety of purposes, such as preparing a one-time study or report or making a single recommendation about a time-sensitive issue coming before the board. Um, second is a rulemaking subcommittee, which I'll just say is really just a form of an ad hoc subcommittee in many ways, um, specific to rulemaking. So such subcommittees are tasked with proposing a specific regulatory amendment, addition or repeal to the full board for consideration, and then often winds down after the board commences formal rulemaking. Um, frankly, a prime example of this would be so far the new rules subcommittee, who has currently been working on uh, um, sort of proposed concepts for how to further investigate and eventually prepare uh, text for things like automated decision making, risk assessments, and cybersecurity audits. Um, finally, we, I describe uh, what is called a subject matter subcommittee, which is typically more of a standing subcommittee uh, tasked with making regular updates and recommendations to a state body, really at key junctures within their subject area, but again, sort of a specific set of deliverables uh, just on an annual basis. Um, now, as can be seen across various state boards and commissions, one size or format does not necessarily fit all when it comes to subcommittees. Uh, some boards never form or utilize subcommittees, while others use them quite regularly, or in some cases are required by law actually to form a specific subcommittee. Um, factors that can inform the best options for a board's subcommittee use include, but are not limited to, the size of the board, the interest in a given subject by board members, size and expertise of staff and or board members, and the likelihood of subject matter overlap between subcommittee topics. Um, the memo then basically concludes with the recommendation that the board consider starting, continuing, and winding down subcommittees uh, when uh, three factors really are, are at play, and that is the subject matter and tasks assigned to the subcommittee can be appropriately bounded so that there aren't any issues with overlapping subject matter that sort of halts the work of either subcommittee. Um, the subcommittee can be given a specific deliverable-based assignment with clear timelines for completion, and that there is a benefit from the heightened engagement, advice, and guidance by a minority of board members on a particular subject. Um, so that really is the memo in a nutshell. Happy to answer any questions, but otherwise, you know, my thought was at this point, I would turn it over to you board members to consider what fits best for your, your board. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Laird. So the recommendation is that we regularize our current subcommittee structure and plan to look over these factors as we move forward? That's correct. That's okay. correct. All right. Um, thank you um, very much, Mr. Laird. Um, uh, comments, questions from board members? Uh, yes, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, I just quickly wanted to ask, I know we have to vote on appointing a member for the process of committee, and I don't know if it is within this topic that we agenda item that we're doing it or not. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, so um, uh, we, um, uh, let me, let me actually, you know what, I think this, this is um, a good place to start talking about that and also more generally, I'm not sure if Mr. Laird I don't recall him mentioning um, when going through the current state of our subcommittees, uh, which is that I believe it's the new role subcommittee is the only one that currently has two members, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, so we have several subcommittees um, that have lost one of their one of their members. Um, I don't think we have any that actually just kind of disappeared because members, all members left. Um, but but we do have um, all all the subcommittees except for the new role subcommittee um, have lost members. And um, I think that this makes it even more of a good opportunity to kind of talk through um, where we are and think about whether um, we should go forward um, with subcommittees um, in the current in the in their current form. Um, whether we should like what we should do to make sure that we're very carefully bounding things um, so that we don't um, inadvertently run into issues um, uh, either now or in the future um, with regards to subject matter um, that we can't share between subcommittees, but you know staff would be able to collect. Um, information and um, and be able to advise um, the board um, or advise sort of more bounded subcommittees. So um, 
I think it's generally, I think it's just a, probably we should just walk through each of the subcommittees um, that we have right now um, and, and see if we can subject them um, to the to the rubric um, and what we think um, is what I would suggest. So short answer to your question, Mr. Latore. Yes, I think, um, and I hope Mr. Laird agrees, like that's a subcommittee question so we can talk about it um, uh, with uh, under this item. Um, and um, we also, it is something that relates perhaps to some degree to the, to the next item. Um, although again, that's sort of a more general framework. So I think that that is absolutely um, a, a fair game to talk about. Um, uh, Mr. McTaggart put his hand up and took it down. Um, that's because you, uh, Madam Chair, you, you uh, answered, I was gonna suggest, cause I'm not super familiar with them. What was your, I mean, the recommendations are kind of general. So what's the specific, does, does do you want to get rid of one or all or some? Okay, yeah, yes, thank you. Um, see, look at that, um, answering questions before they're asked. How awesome is that? Um, uh, yeah, so why don't we list out the subcommittees um, and, and talk them through? And Ms. De La Torre, did you, um, did you want to say something more? I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear the list that uh, the chairperson has in mind. My preference will have been to have this conversation where we have five board members instead of four, which we could, you know, wait a few months and, and be there. But if that is not what we're going to do, then um, I guess we can move ahead and have that conversation. Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And I did mean to say um, um, to, to sort of call back to your observation um, about that um, in December, which I think was um, correct and fair. Like ideally, as we work through our frameworks and policies, um, we'll have a full complement of board members. Um, I'm just hoping that we can balance, um, you know, continuing to move forward um, with the fact that as we have discovered and experienced, board members go, board members come, and for the new board member, it would be wonderful to have that person's input. It also would be nice to continue to build a suite of things that we can hand over to new board members um, that um, will help them, you know, get up to speed quickly. So I was just kind of balancing both of those. Um, but there's no process reason um, or why we would need to fully make decisions today. Um, with regards to talking about our current subcommittees, you know, they're historical and the board members who have the history of those subcommittees are either currently on the board or gone. So um, I still think it's an opportune time um, to talk about to talk about subcommittees because that isn't something that the new board member um, uh, has experience with. So that was my, you know, that was my kind of thinking. I was trying to be responsive um, and also um, uh, also take into account the fact that of course we do, um, we'll have another person coming. Um, so I actually suggest that maybe we start with the new rules. Let me, let me, let me think. Um, so we have, let me just back up and say what um, subcommittees in some form, um, even if it's digital, because they only have one board member we have for, so we all have the picture and also for Mr. McTaggart's benefit, it would be, um, not at all um, surprising um, or at all <laughs> to his um, uh, lack of credit that if he had not kept track um, uh, before he was on the board. Um, so in, um, in June of 2021, in our very first board meeting, um, we formed three subcommittees. Um, one was the Startup Administration Subcommittee, and that was myself and Angela Sierra um, tasked with essentially, you know, being the point of contact um, and being able to bring to the board um, uh, issues related to creating the agency, um, hiring, and, and so forth. And one of our first big tasks was uh, to um, put together um, and uh, uh, implement the um, plan to hire the executive director um, um, and other sort of things of that ilk. Um, uh, secondly, um, we created the public awareness um, subcommittee um, that um, Mr. Lay mentioned earlier, and that was Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson. Um, and the remit of that subcommittee um, was to um, look into and um, help 
um, uh, advise the board on moving forward on our public awareness function. The third um, subcommittee was Ms. De La Torre and myself, and that was the regulations subcommittee. Um, and here, just to um, just to highlight a little bit of what Mr. Laird was talking about, um, we were um, attentive to being especially careful um, about how we would manage information around regulation so that we could comply with Bagley Keene and hopefully still make progress um, on our rulemaking um, while we were hiring staff um, and didn't have them directly um, at that time. So the regulations subcommittee um, was very careful about its boundedness, um, uh, especially in temporarily, especially in terms of time. So we were able to um, uh, um, uh, close to finalize, if we didn't finalize this territory, I actually don't remember if we fully finalized it, but it was very close, um, uh, our agreement with the Office of uh, the Office of the Attorney General to provide um, legal advice to us um, uh, for the rulemaking. And um, we then um, proposed um, uh, to the board and the board adopted an overall plan for commencing uh, rulemaking, which included um, subject matter that would be covered, and it included dissolving the regulation subcommittee, so temporally limited, um, and um, uh, forming three subject matter subcommittees. One, the update CCPA rules subcommittee, which was Ms. Sierra and myself, um, who worked with staff to present to the to provide input to the board um, on topics that were updating um, the uh, the reg existing regulations for um, the changes that came with the CPRA and related. Um, the new rules subcommittee, which is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, um, which um, was tasked with um, and, and has been working on um, topics of, of rulemaking completely new in the CPRA. And we were specific, again, to be very careful that it was clear what the parameters of the subcommittees were. Um, and that includes things like automated decision-making and um, uh, audit and reporting um, functions um, that were set out in the CPRA. And then finally, a process subcommittee that Ms. De La Torre mentioned a few minutes ago, which is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson. Um, and um, that was um, uh, uh, charged with providing guidance and input on process because again, first rulemaking, limited staff and the AG's office was wonderful and amazing, um, but that was hopefully a way as well um, to um, be clear on um, our parameters so that we were um, very, um, very uh, scrupulous and careful with regards to Bagley Keene. Um, so regulation subcommittee then dissolved by date certain and the other three subcommittees came into being. So today um, we have, um, at least in, in theory and that we haven't talked about, dissolving them five subcommittees, um, uh, startup administration, public awareness, which continued, new rules, update um, rules, and the process subcommittee. And there, of course, the only one that is fully um, peopled is the new rules subcommittee. Um, I think there's an argument that it's also really the one that um, has is still sort of working on substantive um, materials for rulemaking. Some of um, their work, as I understand it, did go into the package that went in. Um, but of course, um, the invitation for comments that went out recently um, was um, part of that subcommittee's work. And um, uh, so we're sort of at that stage where an invitation for comment has come out on some of those topics. Um, uh, the Public Awareness Subcommittee, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts, Mr. Lay. Um, uh, my thinking about it was that you and Mr. Thompson, you know, did an amazing job, like making sure staff were supported and that you were giving guidance to staff, um, uh, particularly around, you know, building things out, getting the, um, the, the, um, the ads that went out last year and developing the contract, um, but that that is also something that could um, go to staff with um, the board 
um, either um, giving input as a full board because this is a situation if we compare it to the to the to the list. This is something where it's very clear all the board <laughs> cares a lot um, uh, about it. Um, or we could um, dissolve the subcommittee, which we just kind of it was more general and we didn't put a time limit on it. But then um, uh, create subcommittees for specific, you know, campaigns or specific projects if it seemed to make sense. Um, so that might be a candidate for that approach. Startup administration um, committee might well be a candidate for that approach um, because we have amazing staff. Um, anyway, let me just pause there because um, I do, do think it makes sense to hear Mr. Lay's thoughts um, uh, on the public awareness subcommittee. And I apologize, I have a virus. Um, and so I know my, I have a frog in my throat. So um, I am sorry. And if I need to speak up, someone please tell me. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, yeah, happy to answer that question, but perhaps maybe we want to take a quick break, um, if that would be helpful, you know, um, happy to do that. It is a little, little past lunchtime. Uh, that is a good point. It is one o'clock, and my guess is that um, there are at least some people in the public, if not some of us, who have a need for blood sugar <laughs> increase. Um, how long would you like, Mr. Lay? Uh, you know, at least like 20 minutes would be would be good or more if, if you need you feel necessary. But uh, yeah, that, that would sound good for me. OK, well, why don't we come back at 1.30 p.m.? We'll also take that break at two o'clock. Um, so we may be a little um, that, you know, it's OK. Yeah, it's OK if we skip the two. The two oh, it is. Well. All right. Well, just let me know if that comes back again. Um, and that does mean that, you know, it makes perfect sense to take a 30 minute break now. Um, so let's do that and let's come back at um, now. It will be 1.32. Um, Mr. Sabo, can you um, take care of that for us? And for everyone in the public, we're going to be leaving the meeting, um, but we will come back at 1.32 and look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much. All right, it's 1.30 p.m. on Friday, March 3rd, and the uh, meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board uh, is returning from a break. Um, if everyone is ready, I see Ms. De La Torre's camera is off, so maybe we'll wait for just a minute. And while we wait, Mr. Laird, um, just to check, um, I mentioned I have some kind of virus. I've been coughing. Is it okay if I turn off my camera to cough? Is that acceptable under Bagley King? I just figure people don't want to see Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. But if I turn my camera off, that's what's going on. I'm not doing something else in the background. I'm just coughing. Thank you. Um, all right. Ms. De La Torre, are you with us by chance? All right, let's just give her another minute. Um, thanks everyone. All right, welcome back Ms. De La Torre. Welcome back to everyone. Once again, um, this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is returning from break. Um, we are currently discussing agenda item number five, which is a related to board and agency policies and practices regarding subcommittees. Um, Mr. Laird uh, very helpfully put together and gave us um, 
a memo and kind of walk through it with us um, in terms of considerations that staff recommend we take into account when utilizing subcommittees um, for board and agency work. And we were in the process of talking through um, the subcommittees that we had already set up. Um, we uh, were focusing in a little bit on the public awareness um, subcommittee at the moment. And I believe where we left it was um, I was asking Mr. Lay what his thoughts were in terms of um, whether it's an appropriate time um, given that he doesn't, that the subcommittee, that we've lost two board members um, and we have staff for the, that work to sort of be absorbed back to staff. Um, and then, you know, we create more bounded subcommittees um, or if per example, maybe you know of something ongoing that would have an end point um, or if you had other thoughts. So I believe that is where we were in our discussion. Um, if you would like to um, give us your thoughts. Yeah, um, you know, I think, <clears throat> everyone should have an opportunity to opine on, you know, where the public uh, education should be. You know, I think uh, Mr. Thompson and I, you know, did our best, um, but this isn't an area where no one else has, you know, doesn't like the other board members can't also contribute. So, um, you know, I think, you know, if staff is, you know, willing to reach out to each individual board members to solicit ideas on their public awareness, um, you know, direction, um, and perhaps maybe having an agenda item to summarize those those conversations and maybe discuss those at, at the full board meeting makes sense to me. Um, you know, really, uh, I think a lot of it, you know, I think a lot of my thinking hinges on the the hiring of the public affairs person. Um, you know, we had the subcommittee because we didn't have a public affairs person. We've had the, the job um, out, um, the job <clears throat> application out for, for quite a while. And I believe, you know, the, the process is, you know, kind of coming to an end. So I think it is a good time to <clears throat> transition that responsibility uh, to the public affairs person. Uh, but that said, I do have a lot of ideas on, on <laughs> public education and what, what a good campaign would be. I won't discuss it right now, but, um, yeah, that, that is something I think uh, all, all board members should be able to have input on. So maybe is not the best to tie it all to one subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, so just to summarize and to add some clarification as I understand it. Um, uh, so um, agreement, the board generally um, is very um, interested in this topic. Uh, the subcommittee, um, Mr. Lay, you have some specific um, ideas. Um, so the first um, item I wanted to mention is, uh, I, and I apologize I didn't mention this before, because my understanding is absolutely that um, board members would and should be able to um, do two things. One would be to mention specific ideas to staff. Um, and whether that is in a setting like this or whether that is through um, talking to staff. And one of the benefits of um, having um, staff um, receive that information um, for sort of longstanding commitments like we have for public awareness um, is that staff are able to judge kind of where we are on Bagley Keen and also, you know, things like where we are against the budget so that we can then have a public discussion um, if we need to about things as they are. There was a second component of what you said that I may have gotten or, or may have read in, um, which was potentially having a regularized um, time on uh, agendas to check in on public awareness. Um, Ms. De La Torre is nodding, so I didn't make it up out of whole cloth. Um, was that, would that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be like every board meeting. It, it is just, you know, when, when they do solicit uh, the public affairs person solicits advice from all of the board members and, and is ready to present something. I'd like that to be an item so we can all discuss, uh, you know, everyone's ideas. So if there isn't necessarily a need for it uh, to be regularized, you know, it doesn't have to be, but um, that's something I think the public affairs hire would be better uh, equipped to, to decide. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. That all seems eminently sensible to me. Um, other other thoughts about the um, public awareness subcommittee um, or more generally? All right, well, I'll circle back. Um, oh yes, Mr. McTaggart, please go ahead. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm obviously the most recent person here, and you know, uh, you know, from my perspective, it appears that obviously at the beginning of the process, when there was nobody, you guys were all uh, scrambling to figure out how, how to put it all together. I guess one of my questions would be now. I think part and parcel of this is for me knowing as a board member how often we meet would kind of have an impact on this. So for example, if you met once a year, for example, then you could see, well, boy, we want to have some subcommittees to make sure that work gets done here or the board members have an expert, you know, a, a potential to do stuff. And then again, if we're meeting, you know, twice a month, uh, I'm not saying we should, but I'm, I'm just kind of pushing a, a, a point there that that feels different also. So I kind of think that that's part of one of the the, you know, the two things would be how often do we meet? And then is there always an opportunity for board members to bring items up at those, at the, an agenda item for them to bring up uh, things at those meetings? Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, th and thank you so much for the observation. We've all been meeting so much. That I, um, I, um, I think we have sort of expect expectations, which I'm really glad that you mentioned, because as I said at the top of the meeting in my update, one of my hopes for us putting together these sort of regularized expectations for when we would talk about certain things, always being able to supplement them if something comes up in a public setting um, would be, as I said, um, for us to be able to have a sort of regularized calendar. Um, I will say in my own mind, um, I have been thinking that for sort of settled agenda items, things that we know we're going to need to talk about regularly, um, uh, we can see if, you know, like a quarterly um, meeting will work, but um, I, you know, I anticipate that we would have at least one more within a quarter, at least for now, because we're still um, doing so much um, and that we've been meeting, you know, approximately with some, some sort of schmutz um, about once a month. And it would be nice if we could be, you know, efficient. Um, so that we knew what was coming up and we also were maybe able to meet on sort of a more normal schedule, which most boards meet quarterly, twice yearly. Um, I think there are some that meet every year, but obviously we have a lot to consider and that wouldn't work for us. And quarterly may just not be often enough. Um, and that would always be quarterly supplemented by, you know, meetings as needed, which I expect that we would be needed. Um, but then to your sort of point with regards to this, the sort of the question of how we organize our work more generally, yeah, absolutely. Um, it makes perfect sense that um, part of how we decide to do this um, will be tied to how often we meet as a board. And my view is that we should meet as frequently as a board as we need to um, in order for the board to discuss the topics that we're all fully interested in. Um, uh, like like public awareness, like the budget, for example. Um, there are trade-offs. Every meeting is a production, um, and it requires a lot of staff time. Um, but of course, you know, it's really important that the board have input and oversight um, into a lot of these topics. Um, so um, staff um, are have been very very willing um, to set a lot of meetings for us, and I think you know we'll probably be meeting quite frequently. Um, for a while, and my hope is that we can also have like, you know, a calendar where we see what's coming um, in general. Secondly, um, uh, also uh, perhaps embedded in, in Mr. McTaggart's point um, is that the public board meeting isn't the only opportunity to bring issues to the attention of staff. Um, uh, staff will, and I have checked with them to be sure I can say this, um, and of course I can, you know, because um, they're, they're, they're wonderful, but staff will receive um, ideas um, from us as needed, and they can also um, uh, tell me, you know, we should call a meeting um, on, on X and Y topic, um, as well as board members can, of course, suggest agenda items along the way. So um, there should be ample opportunity for input, um, and this would mostly just mean that it is going through the deputy director, we're all um, eagerly waiting to hire who would be able to sort of in a more um, uh, uh, complete way be able to put things together given that we are unable um, to talk with each other outside of a, a subcommittee. And then if we have a subcommittee, then that really limits the rest of board members' ability um, to do much outside of a public meeting. So that's the thought. Um, Ms. Dela, or sorry, Mr. Sultani, did you want to respond to that briefly? And then Ms. Sultan, Ms. De La Torre, excuse me. I just wanted to offer um, one additional uh, consideration, which is, as the board might know and the public may not know, <clears throat> the Bagley-Keene 
exception that allows us to meet remotely will expire on uh, July of this year. And so having a regularized calendar with you know a quarterly or, or whatever the interval the board decides appropriate with kind of planning that well in advance will be quite helpful given that um, managing facilities and organizing the in-person piece, considering we'll also probably want to do an online component for the public to make it accessible, is really logistically challenging. Uh, uh, in, uh, and so that's that will help quite a lot. So I just wanted to share that that aspect um, uh, coming into July of this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Uh, I was going to um, mention that one of the considerations is how long the meetings are. It is really burdensome for us, and I think for the staff, when we have meetings that go on for six, seven, eight hours, and we haven't done that lately as much, but we have in the past. So from my perspective, I will lean towards saying it might be better to say we meet monthly, knowing that the meetings can be a three hour, four hour meeting, than um, quarterly if that really means that the meetings will be um, really, really long. And it always um, will be possible if um, we decide that it's a monthly schedule, if there is a month when there is not enough in the agenda, that can be canceled and the agency is already, you know, prepared in advance. They have the place secure if it is to happen. It's easier, I think, to cancel than to, um, you know, try to go over the time or um, schedule something that logistically has to happen in a physical location with a short notice. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And that is a good point. And you know, um, this is another reason why I also should have paused and I would like us all to pause right now um, to celebrate a little bit that we are at this point um, where we can talk about regularizing structure and um, uh, you know, directing staff um, to, um, to do some of this work for us um, and to be able to focus the board's attention in meetings. Um, on the kinds of things that um, are very directly tied to vision, strategy, governance, um, and those kinds of things. Um, because, you know, we've kind of often had to meet on stuff that because we didn't, you know, we didn't have staff, so we had to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, and so hopefully um, uh, we are in a place um, where we can focus our collective board time and staff's time putting together our meetings on that kind of thing. Um, but um, I um, think that's a very, also a very helpful suggestion regarding timing, Ms. De La Torre, um, and I have noted it down, so thank you. Um, Ms. Mc, Mr. McTaggart. Thanks. Not a particularly uh, substantive comment, though. I do think it when I joined my first couple of meetings were on the weekend. And I just think for our staff who are proverbially overworked, I think it would be uh, good if we tried to keep um, the meetings to, to work hours for them. Um, I guess the first thing. And then the second thing is I just I don't know what the right meeting is. And eventually I can see getting to a less time. It just feels like right now quarterly probably feels light. Um, and uh, that's my Two cents right there. Great. Yes. Thanks, Mr. McTaggart. And I just want to be clear that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put together all of the different sort of regularized ideas that staff have had for us and that we've talked through, see where we are. I anticipate, you know, probably bringing that up a bit. But next time we meet, you know, just to see where we are with a potential calendar. And I, you know, I hear you, which is why I said I suspect there would be at least one off meeting. Ms. De La Torre's point about timing of the meetings is also helpful. Um, each one does require a um, sort of set, like there's a minimal, sorry, there's a floor on the staff work for each meeting. Um, so that's also something, but if you, you know, we'll just keep all of that in mind as we as we work on it. And absolutely Mr. McTaggart on weekends, it was just the once um, for the for the rulemaking. So, um, and staff's work was very much appreciated. Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I also wanted to mention an idea that I think we um, talked about in the past, which is that if we reserve some of the meetings for administrative um, uh, issues like this one, it might be that we don't need to organize a Zoom around it because there's, you know, there is not that much public need um, of awareness. Obviously, the meetings will still be open, um, and that might help alleviate the burden on the, the staff. 
Thank you. And for that, I will just ask staff to, to note that um, and, and let us know um, if, if that's the case. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sultani nodded, um, popped in to nod. Um, all right, so thank you. So what I suggest is um, we'll, I'll, I'll circle back on the public awareness um, subcommittee, but it seems like um, it probably makes sense for that one to be absorbed um, uh, into the agency. Um, and we will all look forward to hearing from our new director, um, deputy director, um, uh, uh, when, um, when that person arrives. And I understand hiring is processes going on. Um, the next one that has some similarities, um, I think, is probably the Startup and Administration Subcommittee. Um, and that was Angela, um, Sierra, and myself. Um, and, um, uh, you know, without anybody else to, um, to try to be um, uh, interface with DGA, the Department of General Services, and, and so forth, um, and to talk with staff as they came on board, um, as they were putting together our sort of all of their internal things. Um, that was something that we desperately needed at the time, um, and um, thankfully can probably absorb many functions um, into the agency now. Um, then there's also, um, as Ms. De La Torre um, brought up, and I want to be sure that we don't, um, that we um, give it the attention um, required would be um, the process subcommittee for rulemaking, um, which Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, I wasn't on the subcommittee, so I haven't been on the subcommittee, so um, I'm sure Ms. De La Torre can give us more information, but my understanding from our public meetings, what we planned for it was that Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson um, did a lot of work um, um, uh, to sort of help the staff um, with a process um, for rulemaking, which um, we all want to move faster, but it really moved really fast given the constraints. Um, and, um, uh, and so they were able to sort of advise on that. Um, we can talk about it now, we can bring it back up when we talk about the broader, more general rulemaking process that we have coming up in our next agenda item, but I want to ask for Ms. De La Torre's sort of thoughts, um, because again, the rest of us don't have the benefit of your work on that subcommittee. Sure, I'm uh, happy to um, talk about that. I think we also should talk about the CPRA update rules subcommittee, which is an ad hoc, it seems to me like we're on the other end of just almost having that package approved. But, yes, I was um, going to pair that with new rules, which we'll get to next. Uh, okay. Less, less processy, more substance, yeah. Okay. Um, so the um, rulemaking process of committee was tasked, I think it was in March with four different things. The first one was coordinate the generation of a report comparing CPRA with the system regulations applicable to insurance companies. That has not been done and it should continue the work. I haven't received an update on that because the um, subcommittee has not been able to meet, but I think it is urgent because the insurance industry is waiting for us to give them guidance as to how our um, statute applies to them. The second task was to supervise and coordinate rulemaking effort until staff can take over. And I don't disagree with Chair Urban that we probably are at a stage where staff can take over that task. Um, the third task was to provide recommendations as to how to best organize future rulemaking efforts. That's again something that is ongoing and I think it would be beneficial to have as a committee propose ideas for the board to discuss. That should be a board discussion but it is these are advisory subcommittees. They are not decision-making subcommittees. They are structured to bring ideas to the board so that we can have a conversation in a more organized fashion. The last thing that was assigned to the uh, rulemaking process of committee was to consider and make recommendations on any new, any, on any need for additional rules. Um, we haven't had discussions about that in the subcommittee so far, and I'm not sure that that's something that needs to continue within the purview of the subcommittee, uh, but we could, you know, we could leave it there. The agency staff, if they have ideas on um, new, items that might have to be changed. Um, it could be a good um, forum for them to bring it before it comes to the board. 
Um, so I think that this uh, ongoing subcommittee that has a task that has been assigned to it that is important and we should continue this committee until the task is finished. Thank you very much, De La Torre. That, Ms. De La Torre, that was really um, helpful. Um, I'm hoping that maybe Mr. Sultani or Mr. Laird can um, um, touch on the insurance item um, with regard to the others. I'm ticking through them. That'll make sense. With regards to new topics for rules, my thinking is that, again, and one question I have for Ms. De La Torre is kind of how this relates to um, the next agenda item. So I'll come back to you and, and ask about that with regards to generally sort of rulemaking. Um, but with regards to new items, my thinking is that um, it would be probably best at this point now that we have staff um, for that to sort of, again, dissolve um, maybe into a broader purpose so that all board members are able to directly um, bring potential topics um, to staff and staff can kind of compare them in a way that we can't. Um, we had such a minor version of this with the update rules subcommittee, but we had to be very careful about not running into things that in theory could have been something that you and Mr. Lay were working on maybe, or even the process subcommittee maybe. So, um, so it begins, it's a challenge when you add board members to that like layer before the full board meeting, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, so let, maybe let's talk about that, Ms. De La Torre, and then I'll ask Mr. Laird or Mr. Sultani to, to enlighten us on the insurance bit. Uh, you're on mute. It will, uh, just for clarity, it was never intended that board members would have to bring to the subcommittee any idea for new rules. It would be, you know, outside of Buckley Keen if, if that was the case. Uh, I think it was intended for staff to be able to have the choice to bring that conversation to the subcommittee. And uh, it, I don't think that has happened. Um, so I'm open to um, hearing Mr. Sultani's um, and Mr. Lear's ideas about that. But to the extent that we don't have a different process, I would prefer to leave it with the subcommittee until we can consolidate what that process will be. Thank you. Let me just also explain so they can respond. My my word, and you all know I'm the nerd, the Bagley Keen nerd, and I'm sorry. I know I can be kind of pedantic about it, but my worry would just be that, say, Mr. McTaggart or I bring a topic um, to Mr. Laird, and then um, Mr. Laird is precluded from bringing it to the subcommittee because that's two more board members. Um, uh, so we kind of get a little bit stuck. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, uh, not, not quite. I haven't found it difficult to deal with that. I think that that the solution for that would to bring it to the board. If oh, something yeah, has that, been, which, yeah, was, if yeah. we are meeting monthly, that's the solution. If a conversation has been had with two board members, then bring it to the board. Yeah. Well, and that was it. That was, I think we're in agreement on that. That was why that particular function of the process subcommittee, I'm not sure makes sense sort of going forward without like a bound. And um, so Mr. Sultani or Mr. Um, Laird, can you respond to Ms. De La Torre's question? Um, and I think our joint question with regards to the insurance function. Sure, would you like me, Mr. Sultani? Yeah. All right, um, so yes, uh, 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 Ms. De La, De La Torre, we have been, um, Staff has been actually working actively to continue their assessment uh, for that provision, um, and it is actually uh, hoping to sort of finalize that assessment within the coming uh, couple of months at, at most, I would say. So we, um, and then at that point, I think would be prepared to come forward to the board with some recommendations around um, those provisions. Um, I understand we haven't had a chance to check in sort of in a formal subcommittee uh, capacity, but that work has been ongoing from a staff level. Um, so I can assure you of that. And I think it's something we would be prepared to discuss um, sort of with, you know, wh whoever we're <laughs> directed to discuss that with at this point. But I think we'd be prepared to bring uh, the conversation to the board um, in, in, you know, within the next couple of months. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Uh, Mr. McTaggart? Thanks. Well, I, <clears throat> I'd just like to echo what <clears throat> Mr. Latore just said. It feels to me like if there's a regular ability to bring up topics 
uh, to uh, the board uh, and for future rulemaking. And uh, I have some thoughts about the next gen item, but you know, I think um, that's kind of that, that that might solve the problem of the Bagley Keen and you know these things. And I, I again, I'm a big proponent of. I'm I'm not sure that rules proposed should be proposed sort of in secret. I think they're you know to, just to the just to the agency staff and then wait a long time to get back. I think why not come up with them because that's the time you know you come up with an idea and you say well I think this and then you know, two other board members say, well, no, that's a bad idea because of this. And then you think, oh yeah, that's right. And, and then you can maybe save some time there. You get a sense of the board also, because if one person brings up a, a, you know, a proposed rule and all four other people say, that's a terrible idea, then the, probably the person's like, oh, okay, well, let's not waste staff time on that. So I, I, I think um, I'm, I, I'm kind of echoing what, uh, what uh, Ms. Dillatore said there. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. And I actually think we're all in agreement on the, the fundamentals here, which, um, correct me if I'm wrong, which is that all board members have an equitable ability to um, suggest things and that it gets to the board in an efficient and sort of quick manner um, uh, with transparency. But I think maybe process-wise um, for this discussion, I don't know that it could go a couple of ways. Like we could just keep I'm talking about this, but part of that, is, um, Mr. McTaggart's really good point, um, is related to our next agenda item discussion where staff have tried to put together for us um, a potential plan whereby we have dedicated clear time that we're setting priorities for rules, that we're talking about rules, of course, also supplemented with bringing things forward um, on a regular and sort of constant basis as needed. Um, so these things do connect um, uh, um, uh, in various ways. Um, Ms. De La Torre, could I come back to you for just a second and ask um, um, if um, you think that it's advisable, okay, <laughs> reasonable, I don't know, a good approach um, to um, have staff finish up the um, insurance advice um, and report to the board? Do you think that you need um, a subcommittee um, member um, for that purpose. Um, I again, I don't have full insight, so um, yeah, I, I think ideally we should, uh, to be honest, vote to appoint new members to subcommittees the date that the resignation of the member is um, I announced, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the subcommittee will exist forever. But the subcommittee, when it's functioning, can come to the board and suggest that you know they have come to a conclusion in the task that were assigned. So that's why to me, what makes most sense is to appoint a new member to the subcommittee and then allow the subcommittee to go back and meet with these. I, I really do not have much information because before um, the um, announcement uh, that Mr. Um, Thompson was leaving, um, we suspended meetings for several weeks because the agency staff was not available to answer some rather important questions that we had. Um, so even for those questions, I would love to go back to the committee and get, get those answers. Um, so my preference will be to appoint a second member to the subcommittee, allow the subcommittee to meet, and then go back, um, you know, come back to the board and report as to when we think our task will be completed. Okay. Um, well, that's reasonable, Ms. De La Torre. And with that, in that case, um, I will volunteer um, to appoint myself and be your other subcommittee um, member, um, which will also help in the sense that I know the FPPC does it so the chair is on every subcommittee um, in order to make sure that there's traffic. So um, I'm happy to do that and we could, you know, start up um, uh, checking in with staff um, and whatever else I would take your lead since I haven't been on it. I think that we should first ask other members as well yeah. if somebody's yeah. interested. I'm happy if that's the, the result, but I think that everybody should be given an opportunity. Yeah, um, that's true. I would like to hear maybe from Mr. Laird about, again, that process uh, for the FPPC um, is Help, intended to help like with the Bagley Keen thing. Um, but um, that is my main motivator of that. And I assume right. it would be helpful to have. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think from my point of view, especially for member McTaggart who has not had an opportunity to serve in a subcommittee, um, if he has 
uh, an interest to serve, that should be a consideration. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, uh, go in whatever direction the board decides. Okay. Um, um, shall we have some some discussion? Do we want to come back? Um, uh, maybe walk through um, everything and come back as we are and see where we are. Um, okay, Mr. McTaggart. Well, again, I don't want to um, uh, pick things out of order, but it does feel like for me, I kind of would like to get clarity on on item whatever it is the next item, because I think that that will have um, some. As far as I as far as I if I'm remembering correctly, uh, Mr. Latori, the second one you're talking about, which is sort of rules and what rules need to get addressed and all the rest of it, um, may kind of get subsumed by item number six. Six. So may, I just don't know if that is. So I kind of wouldn't mind pausing this discussion to have that. Yeah. If we if that's okay, but I don't want to tell the chair. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> um. So yes, yeah, so that was my understanding. And that's why I brought this up a few minutes ago. So let's pause. We can always re we can recall this um, if unless Mr. Laird lets us fit the process subcommittee under the other. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We can definitely do that. Um, so let's let's pause um, and we'll have a full discussion of the overall framework that staff are recommending, and then we can return um, to this particular um, to this particular um, question about the about the process subcommittee. Um, uh, okay, so we have um, talked about um, public awareness, um, uh, started talking about process, I mentioned a little bit startup and administration subcommittee. Um, I don't have particularly strong feelings about that. Um, uh, um, I'm, you know, grateful to staff um, for doing a wonderful job, um, and I think that um, we could have that subsumed in, into um, into um, staff work. We have two um, subject matter subcommittees, um, the update rules, um, CCPA rules subcommittee, and the new rules subcommittee. The update rules subcommittee um, is me and was um, Angela Sierra, and the new rules subcommittee is Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre. Um, the update rules subcommittee, um, um, the topics that we were working on most directly um, are fielded in the package. There are always other things that an update rules um, subcommittee could do, um, obviously, um, uh, but um, that's where we are on that. And we've talked about where the new rules subcommittee is. Um, so in, in keeping with the sort of suggested rubric that the, that the staff um, suggested, um, it seems to me, and this is my opinion that I'm going to put out, you know, for discussion, um, is that the new rules subcommittee um, has, um, uh, with the topics that it took on, um, has a relatively bounded subject matter um, that we have talked previously about generally kind of how we think about temporally um, limiting subcommittees, like way back in May and June, but we haven't talked about it directly. Um, and that the new rules subcommittee um, is at a point where, and this is where I'm going to ask for Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre's um, input, um, where there is um, there is a reasonable thought that the invitation for comment has gone out, and you know staff could work to put together um, proposed regulations with input from all board members or. Um, there's um, a reasonable world in which, for example, the new rules subcommittee continues to lend its expertise um, on that process. Um, uh, and maybe we just have a little, we have sort of earlier discussions and public meetings um, on, on a rules package. Um, but I think we can find a, a good spot. I will say, I do think this is also an area in which a lot of board members have an interest, um, you know, um, I have a particular interest in automated decision making myself, um, and um, I'm eager to to see what you're coming up with, um, as I always have been. Um, but I think that there that there are a couple different there are various ways that we could do it, um, and without the insight into your subcommittee, um, obviously I don't want to make a strong uh, recommendation um, without having your input. Um, so, Ms. De La Troy, and then Mr. Lay. Uh, yes, uh, so I do believe that this uh, committee should continue um, 
because I think it's been very fruitful in terms of the conversations that we've been having. I also think that we need to approach rulemaking a little bit differently this time. Um, in the prior package, we truly didn't have time. Um, I think that a more appropriate approach will be um, releasing a draft set of regulations for the board discussion way before we have to vote in moving those forward so that we can take the input of the whole board on them, even before releasing a draft, coming to the board as a subcommittee with suggestions on where we think we should go from a policy perspective and getting the input of the board. I still think that the conversations had at the subcommittee level will be valuable to drive that input that will ultimately be received from the board into um, the um, you know the the uh, package that will be hopefully released soon. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Delatory. Um, I think that was pretty responsive to my question about at what sort of stage of baked how baked the things are when the board talks about them. Um, Mr. Lay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Ms. De La Torre. I, I think we have uh, established pretty good cadence um, and you know, we're at kind of a place now in uh, the subcommittee where I think we can start having regular conversations with the full board um, on you know, where we're at on, on these rules and the direction we're taking. So uh, perhaps keeping the, the, the subcommittee in place, but then um, yeah, having a, some sort of standing item on the, the board meetings to yeah, to discuss certain different aspects of, you know, whether it's ADM one month or uh, cybersecurity another, um, you know, I think that 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 makes sense to me and uh, would would help with at least a little bit of continuity in terms of the process that we've set up and kind of the plan that we have with staff um, in developing these rules. Thank you. Um, that is that is very helpful. Um, in the spirit of the framework um, that's been suggested, which I know is informed by a lot of expertise and I think is generally helpful, um, then that, that all makes sense to me. My only question is with my usual nerd bag the keen hat on sort of would the end point then be a package of rules, um, do you think? Um, we can we can figure it out yeah. later, trying to get a good picture. Right, I think that 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 kind of is the next item in the agenda. But based on our experience with the prior package, I think once the package is um, you know put into the tracks for um, going through the public hearings, etc., um, the role of the subcommittee is should be dormant. I think that's what we agree on for um, the uh, prior package, and, and that was presented by the process of committee as an idea. Um, maybe not completely dissolve it, just leave it um, in case um, it is useful for um, the staff to come back to the subcommittee if there is a need for it, um, for a historical purpose or whatever. But once the rules are in, in the administrative process for approval, to me, that is a board product. And we should all have an opportunity to um, have conversations at the board level about any areas that we might want to consider, yes. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. That's helpful. Um, Mr. Lay, did you have, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think to, you know, to your question, you know, I think, uh, yeah, to, Ms. De La Torre mentioned, we'd like to show you all, you know, draft rules while it's still in the pre rulemaking process, while there's still a lot of opportunity to um, yeah, get more input uh, from the board. So just, just to answer your question, yeah, I think maybe not a fully complete rules package, right? But something that you all can take a look at and, and provide comment on during the pre-rulemaking process would be like a good deliverable for, for our subcommittee. Okay. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Laird if that makes sense from staff perspective. And again, we can we can circle back after we talk about the whole process as Ms. Delatory pointed out. Yeah, I, I guess just from my perspective, and it, it's it's what I think I'm hearing is, is as long as sort of we have like a deliverable focus um, sort of for the activity that helps, I think from a staff level, us provide the best support and understand the support we're expected to provide. Um, so, um, so to that point, you know, I, I think, um, 
once that's set out and it sounds like we're, we're kind of in the process of doing that, um, I think we know how, then how to best support um, going forward. So I, I, I don't think I have further questions at this point, although I did see my director just come on. So <laughs> anything further? No, I was just popping on in case I, yeah, no, I'm good. Nothing All right, um, thank you. Okay, so um, as anticipated, there's a connection between some of the rulemaking connected subcommittees and the, the rulemaking sort of regularization um, process. So we've talked about returning back, um, and I think let's just take them all three since, um, although the new rules, I think we've come to a, a good place, but we might as well circle back after we've talked about the whole process just to be sure. Um, and then my question for Mr. Laird is, um, uh, sh we could circle back and we could consider the framework that the staff has um, proposed since we've been adopting these clearly in each meeting now, or we could also just kind of do that together with the um, rulemaking framework. Um, the reason I'm asking is that I'm unsure about public comment. Um, should I go ahead and take public comment on subcommittees now, or can we circle back um, and take public comment when motions are on the table, if that makes sense? Yeah, my, my recommendation might be actually, if I'm getting this correct, is that we can move on to the next agenda item, have that discussion, maybe even end with a motion if there is one to be made, um, and then return to this item for that final public okay. comment motion right. and action. Thank you for clarifying um, that. Um, I once moved, once in all the meetings and all the agenda items, I once moved on accidentally and it burned me. <laughs> and I don't, I don't ever want to do that. Um, uh, so in that case, then let's pause um, our discussion um, on agenda item number five um, with the understanding that we'll circle back um, to provide any final decisions and guidance to staff um, in a bit and move to agenda item number six. Um, Mr. Laird is going to um, present on um, staff's recommendations for um, practices related to rulemaking um, going forward. Um, as I understand it, um, and as this is what we've sort of been discussing throughout, uh, staff um, are hoping to help us um, with a clear and regularized process to provide to staff uh, rulemaking priorities um, and provide input on topics for rulemaking in an equitable um, and efficient um, manner um, and to receive the benefit of um, staff's expertise um, all in line with Bagley Keene um, uh, and to help us set expectations around some of the broader questions so that we have dedicated time where we can expect those to come up. And then also um, be clear that um, we will be working on topics probably um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, organically um, as, as necessary. Um, so if um, you would turn uh, your attention to the materials for agenda item number six, if you'd like to follow along, um, Mr. Laird, may I turn it over to you? Absolutely. And again, I'll try to keep this brief. I won't read what's in the memo exactly, but similar to uh, the subcommittee agenda item, uh, as well as other board kind of policies and procedures we've discussed uh, last December, the memo really is intended to set out a recommended process by which the board members can equitably introduce and consider regulation changes while remaining compliant with Bagley Keene, and then also harmonizing with the timelines and requirements associated with rulemaking under the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, as you know, it can be a lengthy process, and so strategizing sort of our approach to multiple rulemakings, for instance, at the same time takes a little bit of uh, thinking, I think. Um, and so to summarize, the process contemplates this, and that is that individual board members could be uh, provide uh, suggestions to staff for changes or additions, um, and that could happen individually, privately, um, but to Mr. McTaggart's port point could also be made during a public meeting as well. We've had sort of both forms of input in the past. Um, uh, and then staff would then have the opportunity to analyze those requests for things like legality, economic impact, uh, and consistency with existing regulations, as well as other board member proposals that may be coming into us separately at the same time. Um, then our proposal at this point, at least, is at least twice a year. We'd recommend in the spring and the fall to line up with some of the other topics that we talk about, like legislation. Um, staff would present the various suggestions to the board during a public meeting. 
and make recommendations concerning things like the prioritization of suggested amendments, the combination of certain proposals into a single package, and then the need for preliminary fact gathering. Um, also, if there was an interest in assigning a subcommittee, for instance, that would be a good opportunity to do so. The board, of course, would have final say on what amendments they want to advance. Again, back to Mr. McTaggart's point, this would be the opportunity for the you know, four to one say, we don't like that idea, fine, then the board can move on. Um, but, um, but again, this would be the opportunity for the board to kind of hear sort of a thought through strategy on rulemaking and then respond with either advancing those proposals, uh, directing staff or a subcommittee to further analyze the proposals or decline to move it forward. Um, um, and, and would not likely under this process, and this is one of the benefits we think, need to hold multiple meetings on those decisions because we'd already know that they were something at least staff thought was lawful, could weigh in on about economic impact, um, and could also have presented sort of a strategy for how we would maybe move it forward in tandem with other rulemaking efforts. Um, outside of these, though, what I will call sort of biannual prioritization strategy meetings, whatever you want to call it, um, staff would also continue to bring rulemaking packages to the board at other meetings for key decisions, um, such as to go out with a notice package, obviously final approval of rules. We wouldn't want any rulemaking that was currently in process to be having to wait for some sort of, you know, uh, biannual meeting, um, we would bring those separately so that the board could move rulemaking packages through through the APA process as quickly as possible. And overall, I think we think this process honors um, the board's interest in exploring how to fine tune and improve its over regulations over time, while efficiently contending with the constraints of both Bagley Keene and the Administrative Procedures Act. So again, happy to take questions um, or you know fill in further details if, if anybody does uh, uh, have, have further questions about what's being proposed, but we'll otherwise turn it to the board for their consideration. Thank you, um, Mr. Laird. Um, so I have in mind our continuing conversation or our conversation on five, item five, which we'll return to, but also just as a general practical matter. So um, I think it makes um, perfect sense to have regularized times um, to set priorities and talk about strategy and um, think through the, the overall plan. Um, it is, I was correct when I mentioned earlier um, that board members also could reach out to staff with topics um, kind of at any time um, that staff would be, you know, analyzing. Um, and that, and also that um, those topics or the topics you mentioned that staff bring forward um, may well be off of the schedule. I just want to be sure that I wasn't misspeaking there. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, our, our goal would be to sort of allow the ideas to at least, at least come into the staff level uh, uh -huh. as, as, they're developed or as they come to board members, um, but then sort of present them in a uniform structure so the board can kind of consider them equally. Okay, understood. Thank you. Mr. McTaggart? Thank you. <clears throat> so I can see that it makes sense to kind of consolidate uh, the submission prior to going to OAL so you're not going to them every two minutes. But to just just so I'm clear, I mean, I think I think this is the case anyway. There's always a, every agenda has an item where board members can bring things up. But I guess my point would I prefer because you can't talk about stuff unless it's been agenda agenda, right? I'd like to have an agenda item at every board meeting for rulemaking ideas by board members. Not that it necessarily will come up at every time, but I what I'm thinking of is. You know, this is such a fast flowing um, <clears throat> area right now. And we all see things in the news which come up and then you think, gosh, wow, you know, and so there's a, the New York Times does a deep dive on six different things or something comes up. And I think it would be great to be able to talk about that at the next meeting, not have to worry about whether it had been that particular item had been agenda, but just like one board member says, look, I think we should have a regulation around you know, these, these, these health apps tracking your data and sending them to Facebook that, that when that came up, you know, whatever it is. And, um, and then you could have a little bit of a real time discussion of other people saying, yeah, we, we think that's important. And then staff hears, okay, that's, that's, it, that's, that's, you know, there's some there there. So I, I, I would, I guess, want to make sure that this, and this kind of gets back to the previous thing about whether there's a committee, but that there is an opportunity 
for board members to bring up ideas around rulemaking uh, at every meeting. Not that it needs to happen, but just in case they want to. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Ms. De La Torre and then Mr. Lay. I will agree with Member McTaggart that the best way to deal with any concerns about backlinking is to have our conversations as part of um, the board meeting. Um, it seems to me that it will be more transparent for the public as well. Um, one question that I had when I was reading this is um, the idea of individually as a board member drafting rules um, seems to me that should come together with support from staff in that drafting. We haven't identified um, what kind of permanent support the board should have moving forward. Um, I have been of the mind that we should um, think about hiring a secretary of the board, for example. Um, definitely, when it comes to drafting rules, having some form of staff support, actually, you know, um, time allocated with staff will be essential. Um, I just went through the experience with, you know, the last um, rulemaking package where there was a rule where I thought, you know, improvements were needed. And the board suggested during our meeting that I should work with the staff on the rule. But then when I went back to the agency, I think there was a little bit of a disconnect. And I was told that there was no staff available to support a board member to redraft the rule. And I would like to avoid that not only for myself, but also for other board members that might have a specific ideas on rules. So what is the thought in terms of providing support to board members that might want to work on improving existing rules by redrafting them with the staff? Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, Mr. Sultani, did, did you have an answer to the question before we go to Mr. Lay? Okay, thanks, Mr. Lay. I I don't have an answer, but I have a suggestion. And I think this is why i um, trying to balance uh, Ms. Delatore's comments and Mr. McTaggart's comments and Mr. Lair's points with regards to having staff analysis. I think there's a couple of equities here that are that are incredibly important. So I think having the entire board's participation uh, is really important. Having kind of the, um, but I think in addition, having kind of staff's ability to kind of review that incorporate um, legally analyze uh, kind of some of that pre-work is important. And then importantly, and I think in response to Ms. Delatore, then having these regularized meetings where the board can um, essentially uh, set the priorities in order and resource allocation for those individual priorities is important because what, um, you know, we, we currently have, for example, a long list based on the last meeting of a number of board members have already brought forward ideas for future rulemaking that we're staff are, are contemplating. And, you know, I think it'd be helpful to have these regularized set meetings to set which of those, you know, which of the stack we pop to the top and prioritize um, and provide resources to and provide support to. Um, otherwise, I think the challenge is if we're, if you imagine a world where if, if every meeting, you know, if we're doing a monthly meeting every month, the board bring forward new ideas and as Mr. Laird said, these usually take, it's kind of a long process to do the, the requisite fact finding analysis and incorporate it and essentially coordinate the trains, particularly with the economic analysis taking about a year uh, on average. So I think um, we wanna create a venue for board members to air ideas. We wanna create a venue for the staff to be able to, prior to that um, airing of ideas, provide some legal input and provide some analysis and coordination. And then we want some ability for the entire board to tell staff which are the priorities, which should receive staff resources, dedicated staff resources. We're still a small agency. So, so you know, if, a, if each board member would require staff to help support um, a particular rule, that would, we would not actually be able to work on any large package because we'd, we're constantly doing that. So I think I don't have a particular um, position on how this should go. I'm, I think all those pieces need to be considered, particularly uh, um, uh, I, I want to try to avoid being really overly responsive and shifting those priorities every month um, because because of the amount of time it takes to just get things uh, underway. So that's just kind of my general uh, response. And that's in response to Ms. Delatore. We weren't clear, for example, whether the direction to have staff support the 
uh, what the time interval and priority for having staff support a board member on revising the rules. Was that supposed to happen immediately? Was that happen, supposed to happen after the current rulemaking package, et cetera? And so that guidance is gonna be really helpful. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Mr. Sultani. Um, and I think that's again, really helpful background um, information. I'd like to hark back to something that Ms. De La Torre said earlier in the meeting, um, which is I always useful, is that part of the reason why um, I am quite supportive of this um, overall framework is because it does allow um, staff and their expertise to to help us basically. Um, and I would generally um, I would generally um, like to um, help them as well by giving them what they need sort of on a on a timeline that's reasonable and helps them keep moving us forward um, efficiently. Um, Mr. Lay. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I see the um, importance of having a regular time to uh, bring up other regulations. So, you know, or potential regulations for board to discuss. But, uh, you know, as Chair Urban mentioned, you know, I think limiting it to like for staff to have to respond to all of that to, you know, perhaps these predetermined times per year would be better. Um, you know, I, I personally, know what it's like to have uh, someone come in and 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 you're working on a project and all of a sudden the priorities change and you know all of these things different have you just you know disrupting the workflow uh, i am concerned about that um, but i i think having a running list being able to bring it up at every board meeting and then you know giving staff enough time to research and think through and respond to all of uh, you know our concerns that we raise during those meetings makes sense. So uh, maybe a hybrid solution of, of what, what has been proposed. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Okay, um, please forgive me if I have my order wrong, but I think it's Mr. Latore and then Mr. McTiger. Can you unmute Mr. Latore? I would say I'm happy to let Mr. McTiger go first as he has not had an opportunity to comment. Um, Mr. McTaggart? Yeah, thanks. I, I think I'm, I'm on the same page as, as Mr. Lay. I think it makes sense to have a, a venue to bring these topics up at every meeting, but not expect a response from staff, except for these sort of biannual, semi-annual, semi, -annual, semi uh, twice a year meetings. <laughs> I always get by and semi. And I feel like, um, some of this is just life, right? You're 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 a staff. You got this board. They come up. There's a flavor to the of the month. They sort of raise the, something's on fire. They want to address it. But I also think that there's a benefit because in listening to the conversation, the board can all of a sudden say, "Oh wow, this is really important." You know, Cambridge Analytica just happened. We really need to address this. It's sort of, you, you know, so there will be some um, iterating. But I do think it, it would be really valuable on a whole bunch of different levels telling the privacy community what the board is concerned about. All of a sudden, some practice comes to light and five members of the board say, hey, regulator, you know, staff, please develop a regulation about this. We all hate this. You're in the out there in the industry. You know this is coming down the pike. and get some real utility there uh, from the signaling point of view. So I, I, I would support the hybrid, uh, what Mr. Lee just said, being able to bring it up, being able to discuss it, but not expecting staff to come back with a revised rule the next meeting, saving that for the April or the you know, whatever October meeting. Right, I, Mr. McTaggart, um, Ms. Delatore. Yeah, I think that this needs um, careful consideration. I don't disagree with what Mr. McTaggart um, and Mr. Lee had um, proposed. Um, I also think that there has to be some continuity to it for us to even, you know, set the priorities in a way that's the structure for, for the agency. So if we're having like six conversations about what's going on on the news today, I, I, I'm not sure how you know, the agency can organize that. And our own priorities might, might change. So, and, and I also hear what Mr. Sultani said about um, support from the, um, from the uh, staff to board members, and there is a difference, right? Like the, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't believe that any board member will abuse that support. Um, to be honest, but if there is any concern that 
there could be too much of a request from um, the board members to um, the agency staff, then what, what is the threshold? Because to me, suggesting something in a meeting as a thought is very different from having had, you know, a probably 20 minute conversation with the board on a specific request for modifications that actually everybody agreed were needed and then actually drafting those. And I think that also from my perspective, perhaps because of my expertise, I know that I could be, okay, let me put this in a different way. I don't, I wanna put this stuff in the best possible situation when they are presenting to us. And I think, for example, for that particular rule for 702, if I had been allowed to work with the staff, then I will not have been in a position where uh, I have to ask questions from the staff in the middle of a meeting that might make the staff uh, feel uncomfortable. If I can raise those and solve them before the new um, draft is proposed to the board, I think that I'm also placing the staff in a better, in a better position because they will come with the suggested edit with my support, which of course, you know, as a board, you know, we can decide to um, implement or scratch. Um, so I think that there is a space for the more informal, but I think there's also a space for, you know, a, a hands-on approach when a board member wants to actually take one particular role and edit it um, and propose it to the board. I'm not saying that it will be, you know, a decision of the board member, but to me, on the other end of that, right? Like I'm thinking about 702 because, 702 because um, my concerns around it. But on the on the other side, if um, you know a different member had um, a, an idea about drafting uh, or redrafting another rule, to me it will be helpful to look at what is drafted right now and what's the red line that this board member supports, and analyze that before I come to the board meeting so that I can decide whether I support the changes or not. I think that will have value for me as well. Um, the other thing that I'm a little concerned about this um, process is that biannual board meetings could be very, very long. Um, we already went through just one package and I think we had two days and we were trying to be really efficient. So I don't know that biannual board meetings on rulemaking um, priorities are gonna be, um, are gonna give us enough time and again, I'm not saying that they won't. I think that it just merits a little bit of careful consideration. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Leila Torre. Um, if I could, I don't think add to, I think Mr. Laird, you probably had some um, background information in response to Ms. Leila Torre, but uh, clarify that uh, my understanding of the biannual board meetings was that it wouldn't be going through a specific package necessarily um, as we did in October but more again, set, excuse me, <clears throat> um, setting priorities um, uh, more sort of at a higher level. So um, it wouldn't, I agree if we were going through every possible package um, that could be an indefinite <laughs> board meeting in theory, but um, I don't think that was the idea in the regularized meeting. Um, I also just wanted to, um, again, sort of pause and say, what I'm hearing um, in the discussion, it helps me to say it out loud so I don't forget, you know, 10 minutes from now, um, which is, I think that the board is collectively um, uh, very thoughtfully considering some various um, things that will have to be um, uh, weighed against each other, although they're not necessarily really intention. Um, one is um, board input. Um, robust and full board input on items that board members um, care about. Uh, one is um, an ability to be able to um, propose um, topics for rulemaking. Um, one is being able to gain input and expertise from staff. At least I think that that is important. Um, and I heard that some in what Ms. De La Torre was saying as well. And um, one um, that is, um, I apologize, my cold is making me less than efficient. Um, um, and, and one um, that is in uh, being able to um, have um, the ability for um, staff to um, dir direct traffic in a way that we're not creating a big resource drain or um, changing priorities um, uh, in the moment. So I think I'm hearing that everybody would like um, to have a rationalized approach that would um, have a 
um, a positive outcome and would take into consideration at least those things. Um, uh, and if you want to add Ms. Delatore, please go ahead. I apologize. Um, I didn't mean to like um, pause the flow so Mr. Laird could, um, could respond um, uh, to your comment. No, that, that's okay. The only other thing that I wanted to add is that there could be situations where we again choose to create a subcommittee for particular updates. That is the case with other sister agencies that um, we have been in contact with. And I don't see that as um, considered in this proposal, but I think that we should consider that as a possibility. Thank you. Yes, this is the Disentangling, I think it's in the other one, um, the subcommittee, the subcommittee one, the idea that a subject matter, you know, subcommittee looking at a particular rulemaking item. Oh my goodness, I am sorry about my voice. Um, so these would work in harmony, I guess, in concert. Um, Mr. Laird, <laughs> you've been patient, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think there's been some excellent discussion. And I guess I just want to clarify a little bit more where I think I see some of the pieces fitting together with kind of the process we've proposed and what I've heard so far. Um, I mean, I think first and foremost, the you know everything starts with an idea. To Mr. McTaggart's point, um, so um, maybe actually even I'll, I'll just put aside because I I don't have strong feelings one way or the other about the method that sort of ideas come from board members to staff, be it in a public meeting or be it privately. But the um, I, I think the idea is um, you know we we can receive a number of those ideas at a given time, and even before we start putting pen to paper on actual text, there you know we're thinking through a number of things, right? We're thinking, okay, do we feel like we're, we're we comfortably have legal authority to do this? Do we think this is going to come with a fiscal impact, meaning it's going to have to be part of a package that's going to do a state regulatory impact assessment, uh, which is a longer process for rulemaking. Um, and then additionally, you know, how does how does this uh, fit in with existing regulations and existing proposals that are maybe moving? And, and where do we think we could integrate that? So uh, our, our hope would be to have the amount of to have adequate time, sort of not in the fly of a board meeting, but to have time to kind of develop that sort of initial reaction to to a, a proposed regulation. And then at these sort of regularized meetings, be them bi biannual, semi-annual or a different sort of rate. Um, where we could then present sort of all of the ideas that have come forward, uh, again, in any variety of formats, and say things like, okay, so here are, you know, there's one idea to revise regulation 70XX, and there's one uh, idea to add a whole entirely new regulation about our enforcement process, you know, sort of different ideas where then we could say staff's proposal is that we combine these ideas into a single rulemaking package. Um, to then begin working on. And that would also be an excellent juncture to Ms. De La Torre's point where the board could say, we agree, we think we should move that forward, but we actually think a subcommittee would be really valuable to further developing these regulations. Um, similarly, I think this would also be that juncture where the board could say, um, we think there's a few ideas, um, maybe board members disagree about sort of exactly the concept, how it should be done. Staff, we're going to direct you to come up with the text for two, two two ideas to consider. And that would give us sort of a clear directive of the type of work that would be helpful to move from that stage of now just a, a rulemaking idea to actually draft text, a draft package that we're going to start an official rulemaking process for. Um, and then, you know, the, the stage beyond that would be uh, we'd commence then that rulemaking at the board's direction. And we would come back to the rule then at all the usual sort of APA junctures, uh, obviously before the notice package goes out, after public comments been received, um, again, to, to Ms. De La Torre's point, there may be an opportunity where at the board discussion at that point on a particular package, the board discusses um, uh, a public comment that was received and asks staff to, to consider drafting an alternative version that you know, uh, accepts a public comment and one that maybe rejects it or modifies in a different way. Again, at the, that would be at a stage where then we could kind of uh, structurally come up with the options that the board's most interested in hearing so that we're not sort of spending time, um, you know, developing text or, or, or further legal analysis on an issue that maybe uh, isn't going to get traction with the rest of the board. So, that's a that's a lot I've covered. I've tried to combine a number of things, but uh, you know, my goal here really is to set a set a process that both receives all the information, so it gives all, all all board members an opportunity to bring up these ideas, 
gives staff an opportunity not just to evaluate all the legal things, but also just present to you a, a thought for, okay, we can do this all, we think, in three rulemaking packages. And rule rulemaking package one will be our top priority, and it'll include these things. This other rulemaking package we can move at the same time, and this final rulemaking package we can do, you know, once we finish the first two. It would be a strategizing kind of to, to that effect. And then again, um, we could take further direction from the board at that time of, you know, please work with the subcommittee on that text. Please go out for preliminary, you know, comments. Um, uh, certain direction that we could take at, at that stage and then come back on, on each rulemaking package. So I'll stop talking. If you have further questions, happy to keep discussing this. But I, um, I, I think the balance that Mr. Sultani was referring to earlier as well is just we don't want to do what I think we're trying to avoid and for the purpose of sort of staff efficiency is too much work that will not ultimately come into a final product for the board, but work that is uh, along the thinking of the board and would be helpful to the board to finally coming to a final regulation. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Ms. Delatore? Um, yes, a couple more things. Um, so the first one is, um, and I don't see it um, suggested here, but we did it in the prior package. Um, will we potentially bring experts to talk to the board, even to have a conversation with the board when there's any topic that uh, merits, you know, more information to the board um, or a discussion? Um, and I think that could be helpful. Um, I found it helpful when we did it for the uh, initial um, rulemaking. And when we see, as Mr. McTaggart was suggesting, something that comes in the press that we didn't anticipate, to have the benefit of bringing somebody beyond our staff that can be an expert and kind of help us understand more in depth the issues involved, um, can educate us and make us, you know, uh, generate better suggestions in terms of how we have to adapt our regulations. So um, that, that was um, one thought. And then the other one is, will we have opportunities to ask questions from the staff? Um, I, you know, I, I actually have a number of questions that I would love to get answers from the staff, um, but I also wanna put the staff in the best possible position to be thoughtful. I, I don't wanna, I don't think that, um, uh, you know, an item on the agenda where I just come with my question and I throw it at Mr. Lair. <laughs> You know, it's, it's ideal. I think that if we have a process where, you know, some board members can present those questions in a written form to the agency, and maybe we can, you know, consolidate them in topics and have a day where we're talking about one topic and um, our experts know kind of what is in our mind and what are our questions, they, that will put them in the best position to, to give us accurate information. Um, and I think that it should be, that idea should be integrated as well. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Mr. If if I may, I was just going to respond. I, I think that's uh, perfectly fine. And in, in, in my uh, thought, I think that's the idea of, of sort of that first phase of the idea that board members could sort of individually come to staff. Uh, I think the only division I would maybe sort of want to make or, or Clarification is, um, I think we're always happy to discuss with board members sort of concepts, ideas. It, it's just once we have to start turning that into sort of a more formal work, work product, like a, a longer drafting of text that we're, we're looking to sort of wait to take those additional steps till we've got sort of further board direction, but happy, happy to, even, even today, even after the meeting, happy, happy to chat about some of these things. I, um, just for clarity, I was referring to discussing it as a board. And I don't think that's possible without the meeting, although I very much appreciate your offer and probably um, will take advantage of it. I think there is benefit also to have that conversation, not only individually with agency members, which actually will be more burdensome because if it's five people asking you the same question, but also having that conversation as part of a board meeting. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Elatori and Mr. Laird. Uh, Mr. Lay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get what uh, Mr. Latore is saying. I, I do worry about the legal risks if we're just like coming up and, you know, just opining on our own on perhaps flaws in the regulations as we see it um, and that being used against the agency, even if it's not the, the view of the board or actually the legal analysis that is right. So, I mean, that, that is just the one thing I'm concerned about 
Um, I think board members should be able to bring it up. Uh, I just think, you know, maybe as perhaps like an informal rule is like, well, we, we tell staff first, give a heads up. So, you know, in case something like that happens, board members are advised by staff and by, you know, legal, uh, the, the possible consequences for our regulations for California uh, and our, our ability to enforce um, our rules um, don't get undermined by, you know, perhaps conversations that may be misconstrued by OAL, um, outside counsel, or, or other folks. Um, so that, that is just my one concern with, you know, bringing up specific things like in that level and not letting staff um, have a look at it first. But I, I do think, you know, the board should be able to bring up, at least in generalities, uh, concerns and things like that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. And just, just to um, clarify, there are two, there, there are at least two streams um, for board sort of individual proposals of thoughts and ideas. Um, Mr. McTiger was talking about, you know, an agenda item in a public meeting. There's also always the ability to um, ask staff to add it to their list. Um, and if they add it to their list, then they could do that initial review. Is that what you were, um, is that the kind of issue that you were thinking about? Or were you thinking more of thinking about where we are um, in terms of staff's like um, clarity and understanding um, uh, when we get to the, the meetings where we're considering things sort of more cohesively? Oh, for me, I, I mean, I was just thinking, you know, if, if someone has an issue with 700X, right, and and uh, they want to bring it up, you know, I think bringing it up in generalities is okay, but if you start getting into specific legal analysis uh, or, you know, thoughts on, you know, how it, this needs to be interpreted, I think that that becomes kind of a, an issue uh, that would benefit from, you know, staff guidance and, and how that implicates our ability to succeed in, you know, potential enforcement action and things like that. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. McTaggart and then Mr. Latroy. Yeah, I, I don't uh, disagree that, that uh, you, you know, when you're bringing it up, you're not necessarily looking for a huge analysis right then and there. I do think one of the side benefits, uh, as I was thinking about it, of, bring these things up in public is you know um i feel like there could be let's just imagine a situation in the future where one board member was sort of on a jihad about one particular topic and kept on you know asking the staff to use up their time to do something it's it's i think it's a good gating function to have the topics brought up in, in public at the board first of all from a transparency point of view and second of all you know i do think that the uh staff who have a difficult question difficult um uh task in trying to prioritize these things will be able to kind of read the tea leaves so to speak in those moments and i think in general this will not be a problem in general they'll realize okay that was brought up the day before the board meeting you know the the, whatever, the month before we're not gonna have time to get to it uh and uh it's not the critical versus okay we really do need to address this so i'm just uh, uh I, I think i guess what i'm hearing is i feel like there's consensus here i'm not hearing anybody say that the board shouldn't be able to bring up matters at board at every meeting i'm not hearing anybody saying that we need an analysis you know uh outside of those sort of couple times a year i'm not hearing anybody saying we shouldn't be able to also call the staff separately privately if we wanted to and please add stuff to the list um and personally for me if this were the case and we were able to bring these up and we were kind of able to keep a mental list going of what the topics were. Um, and maybe even the staff could assemble that list of what's ongoing. Um, then for me, I feel like that's a big part of our responsibility. I, I, I personally wouldn't necessarily need to be on a separate subcommittee about that because I would think that that kind of the committee of the whole would accomplish that. Thanks, Mr. McTaggart. Um... Yes, I was going to do my summary in a moment. Um, I broadly agree um, that the goals are pretty similar. I, I will say that um, uh, I have one slight request that I would make to the board. Um, I think it's fine to have a standing agenda item. My request to the board would be that um, standing agenda items fine, but check in with staff um, 
I think it's going to be a rare occasion, but um, perhaps not a never occasion where even just a brief, um, you know, flagging an issue is something that staff would be able to flag as, you know what, this is actually something, if, if you wouldn't mind bringing it up in the next board meeting, um, that would let us look into it a little bit further. I don't think this is going to happen much, um, but I would really appreciate if the board would be willing to do that. Um, uh, and then, then I would support proceeding. Um, you know, I'm not going to ask you to like, you know, promise with a formal vote, but I would like to to flag. Or if staff thinks that we should, I'm happy to um, talk about that. But um, I would like to um, echo Mr. Lay's comments, but add this sort of um, gloss as you know, check in, even if it's just brief. Um, uh, so, um, so staff can um, uh, support us in that way. Um, Ms. De La Troy. Oh, thank you. Um, another item that um, is related, but not the process of getting to um, have a draft, but the process of approving a draft is how do we vote on rules? Should we vote on rules in separate packages? Should individual members be able to vote on individual um, sections as a yes and individual sections as a no? Um, I, I do not want to make it more complicated than it needs to be, but I think that we should all be given an opportunity to express our opinion, not only on the whole package, but if there is any piece of the package that we might not see as um, the, the correct policy. And in relation to that, how do we um, think about you know, drafting statements from board members that might agree or disagree with a particular item in a rulemaking package? And, and should we publish those or not publish those? Um, some agencies do both in enforcement and in rulemaking. Um, that's not a topic that we had an opportunity to discuss as a board, but I know that's one of the things that we were thinking in the process of committee, you know, what, what's the right balance for that? Um, thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. Um, so I wanna just pause to say, I think what I'm hearing is broad um, consensus and support for the general parameters um, of the um, staff's um, proposal for some regularization with the understanding that Ms. De La Torre has cautioned us <laughs> about level of detail and time. And um, the memo, if I recall, builds in individual um, uh, proposals and also, of course, meeting as needed. Um, and um, Mr. McTaggart um, would like to have a standing agenda item. I think we're all fine with that. I really want people to mention it. So um, before we're in the public meeting, just so staff can use the benefit of background information that they have if necessary. Um, and then Ms. De La Torre um, is moving into um, a slightly more detailed um, uh, analysis of when rulemaking packages come forward, um, which and how we choose to uh, discuss them, the you know the level of detail um, and um, and sort of how we operate in terms of how we consider them, um, and I think that is also an important conversation. Of course, it ties to like how long is the board. It ties to all of these other things. Um, my thought on that has been that it's likely to be, and I think we need to get as much experience as we can, um, a rather case-by-case -case basis, um, kind of depending on the package. So if we have a if we have a package that is a very sort of administrative procedure kind of package, um, that may be one thing. If we have a package with um, you know substance like we did the last time around, maybe that's another thing. So um, my um, sort of a pre preference at this moment, understanding that we can always revisit, um, would be um, to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and ask staff specifically um, to recommend to us, like, this is how we propose, we, we suggest handling this. And then, of course, as the board, um, we could say, hang on, like, I want to handle this um, uh, somewhat differently for this package. So that would be my suggestion. Um, Mr. Sultani? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for this discussion. I wanted to um, <clears throat> just add one additional um, uh, perspective that I think might be helpful with regards to this concept of just checking in with staff, um, you know, on the proposed topics rulemaking, 
just even a heads up um, or even these concepts of dissenting or concurring statements, et cetera, which is that um, you know, as we move to enforcement, but even rulemaking, staff might be uh, actively working on exact issues, litigating issues, um, working with OAL to resolve issues on the very topics the board um, might bring up. And while we surely can't tell the board um, about ongoing enforcement activities, given the divide uh, as adjudicators, um, it, the heads up would allow us to perhaps be responsive if we're say in active litigation on a particular topic that's you know bringing enforcement action on a particular topic that the board is is flagging for dissent or, or whatever it may be. So the heads up would be probably um, uh, very appreciated as we move, especially as we move into our enforcement prop function, but particularly even in as we're negotiating or working through issues with OAL or others. So just want to flag that and then just a, a small, uh, I'll just stop there. That's fine. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, other, other thoughts? All right. So then um, my um, suggestion uh, is that um, that I will request a motion um, to adopt the process for considering and proposing topics for rulemaking outlined on the memo that memorandum that Mr. Laird gave us, um, and that we have the understanding that board members can. I mean, we don't need to vote on this, but let's just put it. Let's just make it clear that board members um, can propose and bring topics. Um, to staff um, as they occur, and also um, that we will have an agenda item um, uh, for, I'm going to say almost all board meetings or most board meetings, because sometimes we really need to focus a board meeting on sort of one thing. And sometimes, for example, I'll, I'll leave the boilerplate ones out, but at least most board meetings um, uh, that is sort of standing to check in on potential topics for rulemaking. Um, uh, and that like that that we sort of adopt that plan um, with my plea to check in with staff and then circle back um, to the other discussion. So we can have the motion and circle back and then have public comment or do we need to have public? I'm sorry, Mr. Laird. Um, can we do all the motions together or do we have to do them separately because? Um, well, it, uh... If it were possible, I would recommend that we maybe try to at least conclude one of the um, okay. All right. agenda All right. items yeah. before we move back yeah. to the other. Yes, my main concern is always that we make sure that we have a robust public comment. So, Ms. De oh, Mr. Sultani, I apologize. Did I miss something? Uh, no, just a quick clarification on the every meeting and why I think it might be important to give some discretion. As in, and I'll kick it to Mr. Laird to clarify, but... Um, if we have an emergency meeting or a special meeting, oh, yeah. I'm not sure we can do it at those meetings. No. So just yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I think the board will understand the, the parameters like that, but I did want to make sure um, of that. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Just as a reminder, the other piece of this was how often do we meet? And we should bring that into the conversation. Do we settle on monthly? Uh, what, what are we? Do you mean overall or do you mean on rulemaking? Uh, I think the conversation was overall how many times the board meets. So we are assuming that in every meeting or most meetings, we will have at least some time dedicated to this. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you. Um, so that was not specifically on the agenda as sort of a holistic thing. What I had um, said at the top of the meeting and then um, while we were talking about um, subcommittees as well, I think, um, is that the hope is that with these components, um, staff will work on and I'll be able to um, bring to you very soon. I mean, I, I think um, we have a lot of components here in place, legislation, um, a budget, um, we're working here on rulemaking, which are some of the biggest things. And we know from our previous discussion that we'll be um, uh, adding in um, public awareness um, for us to discuss like as an overall plan. Um, and I've taken in um, uh, input um, with regards to broadly how much um, and consideration. So um, this would be a component of that, but not like the whole, um, the whole meeting plan overall, if that makes sense, Ms. Delajoy. Uh, a question, follow-up question on that. 
So is there like a general indication that can be provided of we're aiming at meeting every two months or every month, or there's no indication? And then the second one is for future meetings, will it be possible to circulate the agenda before it's published and allow members to suggest items for every meeting? Um, that I think will be also helpful. Um, two members should be able to suggest an agenda item that has been agendized, that, that has to be agendized because two members can propose um, anything for both. So I, I know that that's taking it into a different direction, but uh, at least an indication of how often do we meet will be helpful. Um, thank, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, my hesitation is not in any of the substance or anything you're saying, it's twofold. One is that we make sure that we are sticking to this agenda. Um, and secondly, that um, staff have the opportunity to put together um, the idea for us to talk about. Um, it will, I'm sure, be informed by our discussion today. And I heard a number of things in our discussion today um, that I will be sure to work with staff on. Um, one is um, from Mr. McTaggart, um, probably um, his sort of sense of things is that a frequency of more than quarterly meetings um, is likely to be necessary. I should say, you know, even if the set items work out to quarterly, um, I, I certainly don't disagree with that. Um, there is um, your observation, Ms. De La Torre, that fewer topics can equal shorter meetings and meeting length is also a consideration. Um, so the longer we go between meetings, you know, maybe the more the agenda um, stacks up. Um, there's also staff brought up the consideration that we will not be able to meet over Zoom. Um, quite soon, so um, I would like their I would like them to help us sort of see like how that might factor in um, uh, and um, uh, and sort of put it all together. So I think we're basically ready to put together an idea. I just um, I'm hesitant both because we need to stick to this agenda item and because I want to be sure staff have a chance to to um, have input on putting everything together if that makes sense. But for these, for, for this topic and these meetings, um, there is a plan in the memo from Phil, which would fit in with all the others. Mr. McTaggart. Oh, hi there. I think that, um, I, I do actually think that the frequency does tie into this agenda item because it's kind of part and parcel. I think at least I'm, I'm thinking it in my mind. And I think if I'm, if I'm, listening to Ms. Torre also in her mind, again, just to, to be absurd, if you had a meeting every two years, that would argue differently about the rulemaking than if you're having one every week. Um, so one way might be to do it um, uh, is to, so, that, so I want to talk about that frequency or tie that in. And then the other thing is, I, just to kind of go back to that point that Mr. Sultani was making, I think it's personally, I would support fine if it's a special meeting or an emergency meeting and you, and you don't have the right to add it to, that's fine. But I've really never been on a board where there wasn't a general agenda item at the end for uh, any other business that a board member wanted to, to, to raise with the understanding that you, you, know, you can't necessarily talk about it at that meeting, but it's, you know, you're bringing it up. So I would, I would like to, I would like to suggest that I, I would like it, you know, this, this notion that board members can bring, bring items up um, be on every be, be at every board meeting. Um, uh, Mr. McTaggart, there is an agenda item on almost every agenda for board members to bring up agenda items for future meetings. Right. Um, and that is a standing item. Um, and so my understanding was that you were proposing an additional standing item that was focused directly on rulemaking um, uh, ideas. We could just as easily do that under the proposal for future agenda items because it's something that would come up on a future agenda. So, you know, a future agenda item could be, um, I, um, I would like to put on the list of future agenda items, X or Y or Z topics for potential rulemaking. So we could do it under our standing item or we could add another standing item, which I understood that you were asking for. I'm as to the legalities of whether it's a separate agenda item or this item. I just want uh, to. I just was responding uh, to the 
the that I just would like it to make for me anyway personally it's a priority to be able to have that flexibility as a board member to bring up uh, the item which could be uh, rulemaking and then just with respect to the frequency I mean I know it's sort of like throwing darts uh, at this point because who knows what the what the future will bring but I I would suggest that we if if we set a minimum sort of like no no we're gonna have at least six meetings a year or something like that uh there would be at least some kind of guidance for the for the board uh as to like okay well we know we're not meeting you know two two times this year um and there may be a just with the summer it may just be more useful to have those meetings mostly over the sort of the winter kind of months or something like that because people's travel schedules or whatever but i i think some an indication like that knowing that things may change might be a good uh way forward on this one thank you mr mctaggart once again um i just want to be sure we stick within our agenda and i wonder mr laird if talking about overall um a uh, meeting schedule could work under the future agenda items as well. Um, with regards to the rulemaking versus anything else, Mr. McTaggart, I don't think there's a legal difference. Um, I understood you to be wanting to have sort of almost a, a messaging um, uh, a component, you know, to the agenda, which is why we would run through um, rulemaking specifically every time. I do not have any kind of a strong opinion on this. Um, my um, feeling about the overall meeting schedule is whatever, whenever Mr. Laird tells us we can talk about it, we can, and I can share um, my thoughts about that now. I will just point out that we are meeting every month, um, and we have been um, for quite a while, um, uh, and like that's been our usual cadence. Okay, um, Mr. Lay, and then Mr. Ms. De La Torre. Oh, yeah, I, I was just going to say that that point is, is we've been meeting every month. Um, I assume at minimum it'll be quarterly. Uh, and, you know, I don't think things will change until, you know, our workload decreases. Thank you. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Um, I, I have a suggestion that could uh, help because this is, um, the conversation has been going on for a while and we have made some comments that um, in a way have modified um, what's in the memo. So I was wondering if it will make sense to have, um, the process of committee exists for one more meeting from this meeting to the next. And then may maybe uh, Chairperson Urban and I could work together on you know, looking at this memo, if there are any modifications. I think that um, there is no reference to the um, adding of the agenda item to all of the meetings. So, so if we could um, adapted to account for this conversation and bring it back in the next meeting for approval. It might just be a cleaner way of doing it uh, because I, you know, I'm seeing we have a chair that is very experienced in trying to summarize our thoughts, but the conversation has been going on for a, for a long time. I think that will also give us an opportunity to give an update on the other two items that have been assigned to that subcommittee and we can just wrap this up um, more cleanly if we, if we do so. Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I, so I, I think that this is a very sensible proposal for a few reasons. One is the board, I think, is very um, carefully and diligently trying to uh, fit together a bunch of different things, some of which are, we can talk about easily under the agenda, some of which we can't, some of which we need some staff input, some of which we don't. Um, and um, if, you know, the board will, um, if the board, um, I'm going to have to recall the other agenda item. So for this agenda item, then, um, I think Ms. De La Torre's um, a suggestion is quite sensible. Um, so we could just hold it over briefly. Um, and that means we don't need to do a motion on this agenda item. Then we'll recall the other one um, and um, discuss process subcommittee and the items that Ms. De La Torre brought up about working all of that through. Um, but I think that this makes a lot of good sense and it will allow for a discussion of a concrete um, uh, idea for, you know, frequency of meetings, among other things. Um, Mr. Laird, is that an acceptable approach? Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Um, does anybody have a burning desire to do a motion and a vote? And it's okay, I shouldn't have phrased it that way. Neutrally, of course, if you'd like to do a motion or a vote, that's just fine. 
Um, I wasn't hearing that though. Okay, um, so then we will take public comments um, if we have any. Mr. Sabo, um, would you um, please um, invite the public uh, to comment if they would like? Yes, um, I am seeing one hand raised, Lane Williams. Um, Lane, uh, when I unmute you, you'll have uh, three minutes uh, to provide your comment. So please begin when ready. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just had a quick clarifying question um, when Chairperson Urban asked or said that you wouldn't be meeting on Zoom. Like, what would that mean for the future of the board meetings? And why are you not meeting on Zoom anymore? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Laird, um, we didn't offer an explanation. Would you like to? Yes, I'm happy to. So um, uh, under the Bagley Keene requirements currently, um, certain provisions have been waived in the existing law that allow for an exclusively virtual meeting like we've been holding. Uh, those provisions, however, are set to expire or to sunset in, on June 30th of this year. So beginning Jul July 1st, uh, many of the sort of pre-COVID, pre-pandemic um, Bagley Keene requirements will go back to into effect including a requirement that um, the board at least convene in a physical location. Um, I'll just add, I know our executive director has hinted at the thought that um, staff is considering, you know, still uh, making the option of a hybrid meeting, but uh, strictly speaking, uh, the Bagley Keene requirements beginning July 1st will be that the board hold uh, meetings um, in a public location physically, uh, where they're all present in one location, and that is where um, the public can can attend to participate. Uh, but again, there's the, uh, I think staff is exploring the option for um, having a hybrid meeting as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Um, Mr. Sabo, is there further um, public comment? And I do want to thank um, Ms. Williams for um, the clarifying question. I think. We've been working within Bagley Keene and the executive order um, for so long, it's easy to forget that we're saying things that don't necessarily make sense to everybody else. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining by phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, and thank you again for the, the comment and clarifying question. Um, with that, we will um, recall agenda item number five, in which we have been discussing um, how the board um, thinks about and utilizes subcommittees based um, on some recommendations from the staff and um, moving into sort of talking through um, how to think about our current subcommittee structure as um, compared to the recommendation, uh, the sort of recommended um, uh, sort of factors um, uh, for us to consider for each of those. Um, we uh, have um, talked through the public awareness subcommittee, um, which we've decided to go ahead and dissolve. Um, and we um, talked mostly through the new rule subcommittee, I think, but we were going to circle back to it. Um, uh, and the startup administration subcommittee, I think, is also fairly straightforward to dissolve. Um, we um, uh, paused our conversation on the process, the rulemaking process subcommittee, um, in order to be able to talk about the overall rulemaking process as well, which we have done. Um, Ms. De La Torre um, has proposed that um, we manage um, all the sort of factors um, that are on the table with regard um, uh, to the meeting um, scope and overall rulemaking process, along with the um, small number of items, but, um, but mighty a number of items that the process subcommittee has uh, in its basket at the moment um, by um, holding the process subcommittee open um, until our next meeting, at least, so that um, the subcommittee can come forward and we can um, uh, sort of finalize um, our plan. Um, as I mentioned before, I would be happy to be the other um, board member. I think it makes some sense if we're talking about some of the admin stuff as well, or, you know, it's sort of all um, connected. Um, but Ms. De La Torre, 
um, uh, made the point, and I, I do agree, I want to be sure um, that other board members have an opportunity um, to say um, whether they have a strong interest um, in this work. Wait, doesn't everybody love process? Isn't everybody's favorite thing process? <laughs> um, just the lawyers? Um, all right. Um, so uh, um, given that, let's expand the conversation a little bit, if we could, um, to um, Ms. De La Torre's sort of idea overall. Um, is there um, support um, for, um, for, that, um, uh, for that approach, other than me, or comments or questions? I, I definitely support that approach. <laughs> And I'm sorry to be clear, Madam Chair. You're saying just keeping process open till next till next board meeting. Sure, I, I support that. Yes. Yes, and that gives the opportunity both to finalize, you know, or get the advice on the insurance, but also to build together the um, the schedule related to rulemaking and sort of the schedule overall, so that we can um, get a clear picture of all of those things. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um. New rule subcommittee, I think um, everyone was in agreement, has substantive work ongoing. Um, the subcommittee was willing um, to continue devoting um, their resources to it. And I should pause here and say again, thank you for that. That is always a consideration. Um, it's a volunteer board. Um, and in addition to our interest, which we all have our interest um, uh, in these matters, um, there's also the fact that we do realize that um, you're doing work um, for the board and the agency. So thank you, Ms. Jolay and Ms. De La Torre for working on that. Um, and um, I believe that the new rules subcommittee is expected um, to request an agenda item at some point um, when you're ready, probably relatively soon, um, that um, with regards to the next step on potential rules. And we expect that we will be able to see a good plan for when um, temporarily it would make sense to dissolve that subcommittee at that time. Um, the um, CCPA update rules subcommittee um, uh, was Ms. Sierra and myself, um, and it has uh, the package that is with um, the Office of Administrative Law right now incorporates a lot of that subcommittee's immediate work. Um, there is, you know, a theory that a subcommittee that is more standing to be available to sort of shift through work to update regulations is that would be one way to do it. Um, uh, as the remaining member of that subcommittee, um, thinking through the recommendation um, from Mr. Laird with regards to um, a kind of um, probably the most straightforward ways to think about subcommittees and my own and I believe advice um, with regards to Bagley Keene, um, I think that having the package out is a good point now to have to dissolve that subcommittee. Um, I believe that is the subcommittees. Um, so I'd like to open up for further comments on, on any of those. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Um, no, I don't have comments. I was just assuming that we might need to put at least on the dissolution of the- Yes, uh, I just want to give everyone okay. a chance um, to weigh in um, on that summary and run through of what we might dissolve and whatnot. Okay. Um, in that case, um, let me see if I can keep them all straight. Um, I will request after public comment, a motion um, to dissolve the public awareness subcommittee, the startup and administration subcommittee, the update rules subcommittee, and to continue the rulemaking process subcommittee, um, at least in, well until the next meeting in order to um, finish up that subcommittee's work and to continue the new rules subcommittee um, until a point in time at which um, a package is sufficiently ready. So that um, I, I think summarizes it appropriately. And um, while we ask for public comment, Mr. Laird can Tell me if I um, uh, can think about whether I missed anything um, that I needed to do uh, in order for the motion to be appropriate. Um, Mr. Sabo, um, would you mind asking if anyone in the 
public has a comment? Yes, this is for agenda item five. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. This is for the board item um, on subcommittees. Again, that's the Zoom raise hand feature or pressing star nine on your phone. I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, um, may I have a motion as stated um, in order to, um, oh, sorry, you know, Mr. Lidge, should I restate it? I think you're fine to refer back to the motion you made earlier. Okay, wonderful. May I have a motion um, uh, as stated um, in the last five minutes um, uh, for us to manage our subcommittee use? I move. I can Thank you, Ms. Delatoy. May I have a second? I can second. Thank you, um, Mr. Lay. Um, Mr. Sabo, would you please call the roll call vote? Yes, this is the motion as stated by the chair for agenda item five. Uh, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. You have four ayes and no nos. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Uh, the motion carries with a vote of four to zero. I thank the board for its careful consideration of this topic um, and um, uh, and we'll we'll work with staff and Ms. De La Torre and I will work with staff um, to to effectuate um, what we have decided here. Um, we should also um, uh, consider a motion uh, to um, adopt the outlines of the board's recommendations um, uh, uh, for this agenda item today, excuse me, the staff's recommendations for this agenda item today, which includes um, the sort of factors to consider. Um, I apologize, I should have put that out and called for public comment um, on both of them together, um, but I believe that um, uh, the um, motion would be um, uh, may I have a motion um, to adopt the recommended practices for utilizing subcommittees of the board outlined in the memorandum provided by Mr. Laird um, for our discussion today. And um, I think we could fairly add taking into account um, uh, any sort of details from, from our discussion today. Um, uh, and that would be, you know, those just sort of looking at these factors as we're making decisions about subcommittees. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Um, if you're, um, if the chairperson is calling a vote, I would prefer to have the edited version of the memo that we can vote on if there have been modifications based on our conversation. I don't know that we need to vote on it, but if we're voting on a document, I would prefer to see the final document. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I don't think there were modifications to just the general factors. Um, Mr. Laird, though, um, do you disagree? It is entirely possible that I have missed something. Um, I think to the to the extent the board it would be voting to essentially adopt what I call a rubric, which are just those three factors in the recommendation section as sort of being the guiding principle for subcommittee adoption, maintenance, or, or um, disbandment in the future. I think it would be fine to just reference that, of course. But if there's something, I, I'm not aware of anything sort of that's changed about sort of the underlying concept. So but if there's something I'm missing, happy happy to take alternative directions. And I'm happy to edit out um, my addendum about our conversation um, to make it as clean as possible, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, and I'm happy to you know generally approve, but if we're voting on a document, we should have a final version of that document in front of us. That's I think will be best practice. Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, so let me just restate, um, just so we um, have a um, clear statement, which would be um, a motion to adopt the recommended practices for utilizing subcommittees of the board outlined in the memorandum provided today by Mr. Laird. Um, and so I will leave that there for the moment and again ask Mr. Sabo if you would mind um, inviting public comment. Uh, we are on agenda item. 
I believe five, <laughs> just to double check, uh, with respect to the staff recommendations. If you'd like to speak on agenda item five, uh, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature uh, or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone. This is for the staff recommendation on agenda item five, uh, board subcommittees. Again, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. And I'm not seeing any hands raised. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, um, may I have a motion as stated? I can, I'll make the motion. That's Thank you, motion from Mr. Lay, may I have a second? I'm happy to second, and I, I know we're on agenda item five, and this is so we're, this is the uh, board and agenda policies and practices subcommittee memo. That is correct. Yes, I second. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I have a motion and a second. Um, Mr. Sabo, would you please perform the roll call vote? Yes, the motion is to adopt the staff recommendation and agenda item five. Uh, board member De La Torre. I'm confused as to why we are adopting. So I don't know what to, you know, how to vote. Could we just get the document in front of us that we're voting at, as opposed to a memo that includes different pieces? The memo is, is agenda item five, that, that memo, right? Right, but we're not voting on the whole memo. I understand that we're voting on a part of that memo and I don't have clarity exactly on what that is. I think there's like three different bullet points within the memo as per what our general counsel just mentioned that we are approving. And I think it would be best if we had, you know, that as a separate document that we're voting on. Or read it out loud. I mean, uh, I just want to have clarity in what we're voting. Thank you. I, um, I might recommend, uh, Chair, if I may, if, if it's fine, then I think we could read into the motion the um, essentially that section of the recommendation section. Um, of course. And that should provide the needed clarity. Yes, yes. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, we've been proceeding by adopting the policies laid out, um, but we have this section on um, on the recommendations. So let me restate. Um, thank you, Mr. Lay and Mr. McTaggart. Um, uh, um, uh, but just to be sure um, that we've clarified, um, May I have a motion to adopt the following recommended practices for utilizing subcommittees of the board. These practices are outlined in the memorandum provided for agenda item five in the meeting today, and they go as followed. Um, to maximize the impact and efficiency of the board's subcommittees going forward, staff recommends that the board adopt a practice of utilizing subcommittees in any of the um, uh, subcommittees, subcommittees, excuse me, when, one, the subject matter and tasks assigned to the subcommittee can be appropriately bounded so as not to overlap with any other existing subcommittee work. Two, the subcommittee can be specific, given specific deliverable-based assignments with clear timelines for completion. And three, the board can benefit from the heightened engagement advice and guidance by a minority of board members on a particular subject. Um, may I have a motion as stated? I move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Mr. Sabo, I have a motion and a second. Um, would you please perform the roll call vote? Yes. Board Member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart? Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. And the vote is four in favor and zero opposed. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo and members of the board. The motion carries with a vote of four um, to zero. Um, I really appreciate the considered and thoughtful discussion of this and the sister agenda item number six. We will now move to agenda item number seven, um, which is um, our item for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. I would simply like to remind everyone before we proceed with public comment um, to please note that um, 
the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. Um, the board can't take any other action on items at this meeting. Although it may seem sometimes like we're being non-responsive, we do not mean to give that impression. Um, and we um, must, this is because we have to follow um, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Um, and it's critical at this point to listen um, to ensure that the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the, either the commenter's goals um, or the goals um, of the board or the agency. Um, so um, with that uh, small introduction, um, Mr. Sabo, um, I would like to request if you um, can check to see if there's public comment. Yes, this is for agenda item seven for public comment on items not on the agenda. Again, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining by phone. This is for agenda item seven, public comment on items not on the agenda. Again, you can raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Saba. Um, in that case, um, let us move on to agenda item number eight. Um, this is our standing item. We follow in most meetings um, about future agenda items. Um, and this discussion can be um, of any future agenda items um, that the board might consider. Do any board members have additional agenda items for the next board meeting? All right, um, is there public comment from those in the audience regarding this item on um, future agenda items? This is for agenda item eight, future agenda items. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand at this time. You can use Zoom's raised hand feature, or you can press star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Again, this is for agenda item eight, future agenda items. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, let us then move to um, agenda item number nine, which is a closed session for discussion of the executive director's annual review, um, closed under authority of government code section 11126, subdivision A, paragraph one. Um, this is our last remaining agenda item before agenda item 10, which is adjournment. And I just wanted to give the public um, a sense of process so everyone can decide whether they would like to stay and wait for us to come back um, to adjourn um, or not. This is why we do this at the end sometimes um, so people can make a good decision. The board will um, leave the, this Zoom um, to repair to our closed session meeting. This Zoom meeting will remain open um, and you're welcome to stay. When the board is finished with its discussion, it will return to this meeting in order um, to um, take up agenda item number 10, um, adjournment. Um, is there public comment from those in the audience on this agenda item before we go into the closed session? If you'd like to speak, Please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature, pressing star nine. This is the final opportunity for public comment before the board enters closed session. Again, that's raise hand if you're on Zoom or star nine. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. And in case there's anyone who doesn't want to wait, um, let me take the opportunity to thank everyone for their attendance um, and any input they gave today. Um, oh, Mr. Sultani, are you asking? To, okay, um, you just moved. I was coughing, sorry, oh, excuse me. 
Okay, yes, I'm aware, I'm familiar with coughing at the moment. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to ask the board members to please move to the Zoom meeting established for the closed session discussion of this agenda item. It takes a little, um, uh, just a little bit to set up. So um, if you wouldn't mind, um, can we plan to begin um, that part of the meeting at 3.45? Um, and I will see everybody um, on the board there and the public when we return um, from that discussion. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thanks to everyone. Um, the board is now returning from its closed session uh, agenda item discussion. Our final agenda item is agenda item number 10, adjournment. I would like to, again, thank everybody, board members, um, staff, um, and members of the public for all of your contributions to the meeting today um, and to the boards and the agency's work. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move. Thank you. Ms. Yonatura has moved. May I have a second? I will second. Thank you. I have a motion to adjourn the meeting from Ms. De La Torre and a second from Mr. Lay. Um, do we have any comments from members of the public? Members of the public, this is on the motion to adjourn. If you'd like to speak on this, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. This is on the motion to adjourn. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, would you please perform the roll call? Yes, the motion is to adjourn. Board Member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban I. You have four votes in favor and no votes against. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo and members of the board. The vote is four to zero um, in, uh, in favor of adjourning. Uh, again, my many thanks for um, all of your thoughtful attention to everything we discussed today and this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board stands adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>